to the chair. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're having some uh, technical difficulty this morning. So Nancy's kind of listening in by phone. So please be patient. Uh, my name is Councilor Mark Grimes. I'm the chair of the Tokyo York Community Council. We'll be chairing today's meeting. The clerk has confirmed we have quorum. I'll call meeting number 26 to order. Welcome everyone. Today's meeting is held by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. The public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live <clears throat> at YouTube at youtube.com backslash Toronto City Council Live. These measures are comply with public health guidelines and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues as we're experiencing this morning. The clerk staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers will be viewed online by visiting the Etobicoke York Community Council page at toronto.ca backslash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Clerk's IT staff will uh, be available to assist members uh, with their devices. As part of each agenda item, I'll ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and will call on members when it's their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask members to ensure they turn on their video and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must still submit free motions by email. Staff will at etc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Metis people. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of the Missile Conflict of Interest Act? If you have one, please raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Seeing none, we have a motion to confirm the minutes from our meeting on June 2nd, 22. Moved by Councilor Prusa. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Now we can go through the items and I'll just go to my anecdote. Hang on. Okay, uh, 26.1, 3 and 36 Marsh Grassway, 7 and 11 Blue Grassway, 1, 2 and 8 Dune Grassway, 4 and 17 Cape Grassway, 5, 10 and 40 Turf Grassway, and 2, 14, 22, 36 and 5 Needle Furway, Rental Housing Demolition Application Final Report. We have speakers at 930. 26.2, 140, 150, 160, 170, 190, and 220 Sherway Drive zoning bylaw amendment application and holding H symbol final report. We have speakers at 930. Twenty six point three, eighteen twenty one, eighteen twenty three, and eighteen thirty one Western Road zoning bylaw amendment application request for direction. Councilor Nunziata. I'll move the staff recommendation. Councilor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 26 4, 8 to 16 Locust Street and 15 Oxford Drive. Official plan and zoning bottom request for direction report. Councilor Nunziata. I'll move the staff recommendation. Councilor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 26-5, Rexdale Boulevard Planning Act applications, status report and construction schedule. Councilor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, move the supplemental uh, staff report on this item. Along with the other recommendations? Uh, Correct. Yes. Okay. So, Councilor Ford is, is moving the supplementary report plus the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 26 6, 175, 185 Eileen Avenue zoning bylaw and application preliminary report. Councilor Nunziata. <clears throat> I'll move the staff recommendation. Councilor does. Nunziata moves the staff recs. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 2675 Capri Road zoning bylaw amendment application draft plan of subdivision for report. Uh, Councillor Hollywood has speakers on that. 
26.8, request for fence exempt to Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447, 17 Alcan Avenue. We have speakers at 10. Request for fence exempt to the Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447, uh, to Charleston Road. We have speakers at 10. 2610, request for fence exempt to the Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447, 21 King George's Road. We have speakers at 10. 2611, request for fence exempt to Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 37 Frost Street. We have speakers at 10. 2612, request for fence exempt to Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 41 Hallow Crescent. Speakers at 10. 2613, request for fence exempt to Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 5 from Crescent. Speakers at 10. 2614, request for fencing zone, Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 68 Burroughs Avenue, speakers at 10. 2615, request for fencing zone, Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 62 Clement Road, speakers at 10. 2616, request for fencing zone, Toronto Missile Code, 447, 54 Fremont Avenue, speakers at 10. 2617, application to remove a private tree, 26 Greenfield Drive. We have speakers at 1015. 2618, pedestrian crossing protection, Chartwell Road and Badger Drive. Uh, Councillor Ford, can you move the staff recommendations for me, please? So moved, Mr. Chair. Councillor Ford moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 2619, amendment to existing speed hump plan, Flamborough Drive between Keel Street and Culford Road. Councillor Nunziata. I move the staff recommendation. Councilor Evans, the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 2620, traffic calming, Carlton Crescent. Councilor Nunziata. Yes, I do have a motion that we've sent to the clerk. Okay. Motion's on the screen. And what could you explain what it is, Councilor Nunziata? To, um, to waive the petition and polling requirement under the city's traffic calming policy and authorize the installation of one traffic calming device at 30 Harleton Crescent and direct the city solicitor to prepare a bylaw to alter the roadway to install one speed hump at 30 Harleton Crescent. Okay, the motion's on the screen. Yep. Um, just call the vote slowly. I don't need a recorded vote, but I just want the camera to capture uh, my opposition. I understand. Thanks. Uh, motion's on the screen. All in favor? Opposed? Mr. Holiday in the negative, that carries. 2621, traffic control signal to three and Halston Road. Councilor Nunziata. Move staff recommendation. Councilor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor, opposed, that is carried. 2622, always stop control Wall Avenue and Snowberry Avenue. Councilor Nunziata. Yes, I do have a motion uh, to direct the uh, general manager of transportation st uh, services to install an all way stop control at the intersection of Wall Avenue and Snowberry Avenue. Okay, we we'll get the motion on the screen and Councillor Holiday, I'll go slow for you. The motion is on the screen, all in favor? Opposed? Councillor Holiday in the negative, that carries. 2623, turn probably 6th Street and Morrison. Uh, Councillor Ford, can you move the staff recommendations for me, please? So move, Mr. Chair. Councillor Ford moves the staff recommendations. All in favor. favor, favor. Opposed. Carried. 2624, accessible parking space is September 21. Delegated. We have a motion. Uh, Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I move the staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor. Opposed. Carried. 2625, introduction of overnight on street permit parking, Eastwood Park Gardens and Long Branch Avenue. Councillor Ford, can you move my staff recommendations there for me, please? So moved, Mr. Chair. Councillor Ford moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 2026, parking amendment, Maple Leaf Drive between Keel Street and Erie Street, Councillor Nunziata. I'll move the staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed, carried. 2627, parking amendments on Hartfield Road. Council Deputy Mayor Holiday. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the staff recommendations. Deputy Mayor Holiday moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed, carried. 
2628 Adult Culture Initiatives in Tobacco, York. Uh, there's a staff recommendation on this. Um, you know, we're having a, a staff a presentation on this, sorry. 2629 appointments to business improvement area boards of management. Councilor Nunziata and Grimes' ward. Councilor Nunziata. I've moved the recommendation. Councilor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, I have <clears throat> new business uh, from uh, number of new business 26 installation of speed humps on uh, Chandridge present. Uh, non residential demolition application 975 Western Road. I need a motion to add those to the agenda. Moved by Deputy Mayor Holiday. All in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, Nancy, if you can hear me, you okay? Yes, all as well. We could pursue uh, item one now. Thank you. Okay. Before you do that, uh, I, I have a point of order, um, Council Putra. Put, yeah, uh, okay, point of order, sure. Um, I have a uh, a memo. The clerk may actually have it. I wanted to add an additional item to the agenda: a reopening of a fence exemption uh, that we dealt with. Um, uh, so, so that's coming, and I and I'm. Um, so, if I can, if I can. Sorry, just, Council Prudence, so, so the clerk has that already. I, I believe the clerk may okay, have it. Gonna, uh, Nancy, do you have that? If I could just take a look in emails and get back to you, just to okay, make sure so, that's accurate. Okay. Okay. Well, Council so, Prudence, so, we'll deal with that. Uh, Nancy's having some problems. And, so and, yeah. and 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 one other um, uh, question of you, Mr. Chair, or or the clerk rather. I wanted to uh, reduce the speed limit on a couple of roads in my area that are currently being reduced to 30 kilometers, but they've kind of like were omitted two very short of three very short stretches of street. It, do I do it here at community council or is that an infrastructure item that matter? Because I would I, like to do that. Huh? I believe you have to bring that onto the floor as an item and it's not before, here, it's here at community council or or at uh, infrastructure. I got Nancy. Um, Councilor Perusa, can we just talk offline about that and I'll get back to you? Sure. Um, do you have my, do you have my number? I'll communicate with you by email. Uh, okay. Okay. So, sure. Nancy, have some difficulties. We'll deal with that. I promise we'll deal with both those issues for you. Okay. Uh, we'll get an answer on one and the other one when you, when Nancy gets it, we'll get it on the floor. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So going on to. Uh, uh, there are first item three in uh, 36 Marsh Grassway, seven in Blue Way Grassway, one, two, eight, June Grassway, four, and 17 Kane Grassway, five, 10, and 40 Turf Grassway, and two, 14, 22, 36, and five Needle Furway Rental Housing Demolition Application. We have speakers. If I can just go to my list. And our first speaker, um, I don't have speakers on number one. Do we have speakers on number one? Uh, we don't have any speakers. No speakers on one. Councillor. Councillor Peruzza, do you have questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Peruzza, we unmute, please. No, no questions. Uh, no questions of staff. I'm. Any other I'm, members have questions of staff? I, I'm surprised that there's, there's nobody here. Um, Maybe just ask the clerk again. There's nobody here from Toronto Community Housing oh. that's here to speak to the matter. No, there's no speakers, Councilor Prutza. And any other uh, members wish to have questions of staff? Seeing none, Councilor Prutza. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, then I'm, you know, I'm. Uh, I would like to move the uh, the the report that's um, that's in front of us. Um, uh, just uh, very briefly, this is a uh, um, a Toronto community housing uh, site uh, or project uh, that uh, is located at the corner of uh, Fir Grove and uh, and Jane Street. Uh, uh, this housing has been in uh, in the, the housing that is there now has been in um, you know in a, in a bad state for for um, for a long time, and this is a. Really, um, a plan that we have uh, before us to um, to revitalize and uh, and uh, 
and, and rebuild uh, both the housing and uh, a more integrated uh, mixed community. community. Um, there, so there's a uh, uh, so we have this uh, this proposal and um, uh, today uh, and it, and it's really intended to uh, um, uh, to redo uh, a, a much uh, uh, needed uh, um, uh, to rebuild much needed housing in uh, in our area. So I'm uh, happy to move that. Thank you, Council Prince. Any further speakers? Seeing none. The recommendation before us. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Right along our next item 26.2, 140, 150, 160, 170, 190, and 220 Sherway Drive zoning bylaw amendment application and holding of H symbol final report. <clears throat> Just for my colleagues' uh, information, this is the Trillium Health Center down by Sherway. And we have Sean Kerr, our first speaker from Trillium Health Partners. Good morning, Mr. Kerr. Are you on the line? I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Very, very happy to be here today. Good morning, Mr. Kerr. Welcome, sir. Five Great, and perhaps the clerk's office uh, could put up some of the slides that uh, I'd shared, but uh, shared earlier, and just go to slide two. Um, but uh, with that, I will start. Uh, thank you so much for having me to, to here today to speak in support of the application. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with the project and and have been following it, and uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk more about it today. Over the next 20 years, Trillium Health Partners is going to, will experience seven times more growth than the average hospital. By 2041, the community will grow by 45%. Seniors will increase by 133%. But government investments have not kept up with the pace and growth of, and changes in this community. And today, THP is undersized and under-resourced. There is a bad need for new beds uh, here at THP. And the COVID pandemic has only exacerbated these challenges. We've seen the second highest volume of COVID patients of any hospital in the province. Not a day has passed since March 2020 where there's not been a patient in our care who has COVID-19. COVID's had an extraordinary impact on the hospital, our healthcare workers, the community. The pandemic's exacerbated our existing capacity challenges, reduced access to sur surgeries, screening diagnostics, and had a major impact on our people. But in the face of this most challenging time in our history, our staff have consistently stepped up to deliver high quality and safe care. Over the last 18 months, Trillium has, has treated almost 2,800 COVID patients, conducted 360,000 COVID tests, and the most important thing, we've done 500,000 vaccines to be able to get our community back to being safe. But to care for future generations, we must grow and renew our Mississauga Hospital and the Queensway Health Center. The project at the Queensway Health Center is an important part of, of the THP strategy to improve health care for this community and will be the biggest health care expansion in South Etobicoke's history. It represents a unique city building opportunity to benefit the community for years to come. The redevelopment will create a modern post-acute hospital for complex continuing care and rehabilitation patients. It will include an eight-story parking structure, nine-story inpatient tower, 352 new beds with a shelled-in space to add another 64 beds in the future, enhanced site landscaping, and a new entry plaza. And the development will allow for future site regeneration and flexibility, all subject to provincial government approval, of course. But building healthcare is not uncomplicated. Development of this site is constrained by the Etobicoke Creek uh, to the south southwest of our property, the existing footprint of the site, and of course, it all must occur while we continue to operate a hospital. This project cannot proceed without the city's approval and uh, today and each and every day is critical to ensuring we bring these badly needed services to the community as soon as possible. Approval of the zoning bylaw will mean that we can begin, begin construction of the new parkade this fall and issue a request for proposals for the new patient tower in the spring of 2022. I do want to emphasize that much work still needs to be done before the RFP can be issued for this project. Under the proposed bylaw, a number of steps need to be taken to advance planning of the future road that will connect the Queensway and the West Mall through the hospital site. We ask that city staff continue to work collaboratively and creatively with Trillium to resolve any implementation as quickly as possible. I would also like to thank. Good morning. Morning. I would also like to thank the many, many, many staff 
at the city who have had a hand in advancing this project. We would not be here today if the city had not prioritized it, and we were very thankful for this effort. I'd also want to thank Councillor Grimes, Jobico Council, for your ongoing support of Trillium throughout the pandemic and this planning process. Our request is that Council support this historic expansion of healthcare by approving this project today and continuing to rapidly advance the planning associated with the build. Thank you and happy to take any questions. And I, I didn't see the slides, so I'm not sure if they were able to get up by the clerk's office, but we do have a, a rendering and a map that might be helpful if there are any questions by council today. Councillor Grimes, I think you might be on uh, mute there. There we go. Sorry, any uh, questions for the deputy? Um, Chair Grimes, may I just ask a very simple, easy one to Mr. Kerr? Mayor Holiday, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I don't know that we have access to the presentation. Um, and I just wondered if you could send it along because I'm interested. And uh, with your permission, um, we would like to be able to share that information with, with constituents because uh, Trillium serves uh, Ward 2 uh, and is an important community asset. And I think people are interested in the changes that you're proposing. and. It would be helpful to share that information more widespread. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I will follow up with your office and happy to work with uh, work with you to share that information. Thank you. Any further questions of deputy? I'll just uh, Sean very quickly. I know at the end of your deputation you mentioned the timelines. You kind of you've got your foot on the gas. So the parking structure will go first, and all thing going well. We're looking at 2022 for the next. Can you maybe just spell out the phased approach to the whole site in a perfect world? Yes, uh, so uh, early works uh, prep work will be happening this fall on the site for the parkade and then construction of the parkade, which is at the south end of the property, would occur early in the new year. And then the request for proposals would go out uh, in the in the fall, which is uh, or sorry, in the spring, uh, which uh, will will take us kind of late into the year, and then hopefully construction the the the, the year after. So we are, uh, you know, every day is a is a day either uh, gained or lost in the project schedule to be able to uh, bring these services on board. So 2023, you're looking to get a shovel in the ground on the actual tower going up, correct? Yes. Perfect. Those are my questions. Uh, seeing no more, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Our next speaker is Kate Lyons from Goodman's LLP. Kate, are you on the line? Can, can you hear me? We can hear you, Kate. Welcome, good morning, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. I'm actually, I think that, um, that Sean has covered everything and I have nothing to add. I know your time is valuable and I won't take it up. Great. Thank you, Kate. Appreciate you uh, coming on this morning. Our next speaker, Antonio Gomez. Thank you, Councillor, and likewise to Kate. I think the uh, items are covered. We're here to answer any questions should they uh, be needed. Great. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further correct to the clerks of the uh, I will just speak because this is my award. This is a very exciting project. I know Councillor Holiday agrees with me and my neighbor. Uh, this uh, hospital serves a, you know, a lot of Etobicoke, probably up in the Councillor Ford's ward also. So, you know, we always hear about uh, keeping up, the infrastructure keeping up with the growth. I don't have to tell Councillor Ford and Holiday, and I'm sure my other colleagues, Nunziata and Perutza, understand also the amount of growth that's happening on Dundas Street, the Queensway. We've got the secondary plan next door at Sherway Gardens. There's a lot of growth happening. Uh, even across from Sherway. So this is great news to my community and to Councillor Holiday's community and Councillor Ford's community. This will service uh, uh, a badly needed uh, area. At, uh, and, and I think it's like Councillor Holiday said, our people will be very interested in, in hearing what's happening here and be excited to see this happen. So I'm excited to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> this to happen and uh, whatever I can do to help move it along. I know there's been great discussions going on with uh, with planning and, and with Trillium and hopefully we and uh, get this thing moving as fast as we can. And I know all my colleagues here out in the, uh, the West End here support what's happening at Trillium. So with that, I'll move the staff recommendations and look for your support. Any further speakers? Seeing none, the recommendation will be forced. All in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Moving right along, our our next item is 26.5555 Rexdale Boulevard Planning Act application status 
staff report and construction schedule. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. 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 Chair, like point of order. Point of um, order, Councilor. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe in the run through of the agenda, we uh, we dealt with this item. Uh, we did. Uh, Nancy, do we deal with that? Item three has been dealt with. Councilor Nunziata moved a motion. So to I'm, I'm, I'm reading off. No, I'm reading number five. Sorry, number five. Yes, uh, Councillor Ford has adopted the su supplementary, uh, the recommendations in the supplementary report. Okay, I see we have a speaker on this. Well, I might reopen the speaker. Our here, speaker. Yes, if if we can uh, reopen the item to reconsider okay. and hear the speaker, please. Motion to reopen twenty six point five five five. Rex of Bowler, all in favor? Opposed. That is carried. Our first speaker is uh, Bernard Capzang. Miss Bernard, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am, Councillor. Good morning, sir. We skipped over you, sir. Welcome, and you have five minutes this morning. Uh, no worries. I want to just keep this brief. Really, it was just here uh, on the line if, it, if uh, the community council had any questions, but we're in support of uh, the recommendation uh, in the staff report, specifically, you know, the revised construction schedule. Um, you know, other than that, you know, the conditional permits are very important to us to continue moving ahead uh, and fulfilling our commitments. Uh, you know, with the city to ensure the viability of the project and the delivery of the numerous community benefits uh, that it will provide. Great, thank you, Bernard. Any questions yeah. for Bernard? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Ford, I hand it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, just move the uh, supplemental report and uh, continue uh, to show uh, or share my appreciation uh, with uh, Toronto One Woodbine and our city staff as this uh, continues to uh, develop in the Northwest. Thank you, Councillor Ford. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 26 7 5 Capri Road zoning bylaw application and draft plan of subdivision from report. Uh, first speaker is Evan Perlman from 10 Block. Evan, are you with us? Hi, good morning. Good morning, Evan. Welcome. You have five minutes to speak to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Evan Perlman. I'm a development manager at 10 Block for the project. Just wanted to briefly thank Councillor Holliday for his feedback and time so far on the project. And also just thank City of Toronto staff, including Sarah Henstock, Allison Reed, Sabrina Salatino, uh, Vanathy Gane Saraja, and Nick Garisto. And otherwise, just glad to answer any questions if necessary. Thank you. Any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, uh, speakers, uh, Councilor Thank you, Chair Grimes. Um, thank you, Mr. Perlman. Um, I believe um, the clerk has a very brief motion. Thank you. Um, it's just to circulate the planning application uh, to include Toronto Public Health um, for comments on um, aircraft highway and transportation related noise and air quality. Uh, members, you'll recognize this motion. I, I move it uh, uh, when I can uh, with any developments that occur uh, along the 427 highway. And I uh, would just give comment that it's a, uh, it's a major project and I look forward to uh, the work ahead. And I uh, hope you will support the amendment and um, uh, complete the application, um, the preliminary report for the application today. Thank you, Councilor. The motion's on the screen. All in favor, opposed, carried. I just wonder, all in favor, opposed, carried. 26.8 request for fence exemption, Toronto Code, Chapter 447, 17 Alcan Avenue. Um, are there any speakers on the item? Seeing none there, uh, uh, we have registered speakers sorry? on, we have registered speakers on the item. Okay. I'm not showing those Nancy. So I'll, could you please uh, read them out for me, please? Uh, Jonathan Kahn and Cameron sure. Dredger. Okay. Got the first speaker, Jonathan. 
Thanks, Councillor Grimes, uh, and appreciate uh, the community council's time. Um, before I, I, or as an opening remarks, I just wanted to acknowledge the the bylaw officer in this particular case. Uh, he was extremely uh, reasonable, thoughtful, uh, helpful uh, through the process, and just just want to acknowledge off the top um, uh, how pleased we were uh, with that part of it. I'll, I'll structure my remarks in in two segments. One is just to give you some context and background. Uh, and then second is to talk a little bit about the rationale as to, as to why uh, I've put it forward. So uh, our family has moved into the neighborhood about uh, just over seven years ago. It'll be eight years in June. Uh, certainly what attracted us was was that it's a very family friendly, almost exclusively uh, families and single family homes. Um, we have a young family. Now our kids are, are six and three. Um, and as part of uh, of the community, we do happen to have uh, adjacent to us is is a multi-unit uh, property that's used with with multiple tenants um, historically uh, there have been up to six tenants uh, in the past um, and what we found is as our kids have gotten a little bit older um, some of the activities that happen in such a, a property obviously are out of our control and and just without getting into too much detail just to be frank uh, they're not things that we want our children exposed to in terms of seeing them. You know, it wasn't an issue when they were quite, quite young because they just didn't know what it was. But now that they're older, um, you know, it, it's just something we don't want them exposed to. So uh, we proceeded to review the bylaws. And I just want to acknowledge as well that, you know, at, at no time was there an intention to proceed before seeking permission. In fact, we had actually reviewed the bylaws to make sure that we were doing something within that context. And And, you know, my earlier remarks about the bylaw officer being supportive, you know, we were out of town when he uh, made notification of the violation, but in speaking to him uh, to understand his perspective, uh, it was also very um, positive to hear that he also understood, you know, how we were looking at things. So uh, in terms of, of rationale, I just wanted to point to two specific items that uh, that we had looked at, and it's from chapter 447. Uh, one is around the definitions and uh, the defined term of, of what a single residential property is and what a multiple residential property is. And, and a single is indicates that it's not more than two, uh, two units. And then the second item I just want to raise, uh, it relates to some of the fencing exception. So for context, we have a raised uh, deck and unroofed deck and item five within section 1.2 of chapter 447 does permit a, a fence that's no more than two meters above the surface of the deck. So I highlight that just to, to indicate that um, what has been uh, put up, in fact, does does fall within that. And in speaking with the bylaw officer, um, what he indicated to me was, look, he recognizes that although it's attached to the deck uh, and it would fall within that, it's also has part of it attached to the fence. And so his interpretation was, look, it's effectively an extension of the fence, which I can totally appreciate. Um, it, it was positive that he acknowledged my interpretation. So at least that was, that was positive there. The second thing I want to mention is there is also item six in that same table that makes reference to permitting uh, a fence to be up to two and a half meters if it abuts a multi-residential property. And, and that's why I raised the definitions earlier that are in that chapter. Again, in speaking with the bylaw officer, he was very uh, reasonable and did uh, acknowledge that, you know, one would could interpret it the way that I have, which is effectively say, look, we have this multi-tenant uh, property that's adjacent and therefore you know, a two and a half meter exemption would 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 make sense. So, in any case, I just wanted to provide that context because, uh, as I said, there was no intention to move forward without seeking permission. And 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 as you saw through these two items, through that interpretation, uh, what we've put up is in fact within what's permitted um, and, and in the spirit of what's. There. I mean, uh, you know, our view and we have a lot of support uh, from existing uh, neighbors, not only those adjacent. Uh, and you'll hear from uh, from Cameron uh, shortly, who actually owns the property next door. Uh, he's been, you know, very, very supportive and helpful to the process. We have a good ongoing dialogue, uh, and we'll continue to do so as good neighbors. I did also reach out to other neighbors that, although they're not directly adjacent, they do see the fence and they do see the divider. So I wanted to make sure that we we got their support, which we did as well. So um, I recognize that exemptions aren't aren't ideal, but certainly in the context here. Uh, you know, our recommendation is is hopefully that you'll you'll support on the basis of the fact that it is permitted for an unroofed deck, and then uh, that it does multi abut a multi residential property, and therefore within there. So, thanks for your time, uh, and uh, and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. I was had questions for, but you answered them all uh, in your deputation. So I'm good with that. Any further questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Nancy, to introduce our next speaker, please. It's Cameron, Cam, uh, Cameron Dredger. Uh, 
uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you for your time, uh, Council. Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, uh, I think Jonathan kind of mentioned it all. Uh, there's just a couple things. Uh, Although it is uh, close to the deck, it, it is not attached. It is uh, a fence, and this is a fence exemption, not a attached in any way. Uh, well, with the exception of a um, piece of wood that connects the two, but it's not together. Um, so I support the fence in its um, current height and length. Uh, I'm okay with that if um, that helps uh, being a good neighbor. Uh, what I do uh, request is that it be built to, to uh, structural code. Um, I feel that um, perhaps the structure is a little top heavy as it's currently built and um, is uh, attached to an old fence. And I think uh, it should be uh, at least adhered to the building for that. Um, I think that's that's my main point here. Thanks. Great, thank you. Questions of the deputy? Seeing none, thank you. And there's no further speakers, correct? To the clerks? No additional Questions speakers. Okay. Okay. Uh, seeing no other uh, questions, staff. This is my ward, my office, and working with the applicant here. There's uh, great uh, community support on this, as you heard from one of the neighbors. But uh, there's also other letters of support, uh, and I, I I had this one, one of these uh, at my former house, so I'm a supporter. I'm going to be moving recommendation number two to grant the application and look for my colleagues' support. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. That carries. Uh, moving right along. Twenty six point nine request of Toronto Missile Code, Chapter four four seven two Charleston Road. Our first speaker is James Marini. James, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Uh, you have five minutes. Uh, well, the reason why I'm here is uh, just mainly to answer any questions if need be. And I want to thank everyone for this opportunity. Thank you. Questions of the deputy. Councilor Holiday, Deputy Mayor Holiday, uh, question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mirini, thank you for taking the time to come out to Community Council. Um, I, I take note of your fence. I've been by, I've seen it. Uh, and I have um, some thoughts on it. Um, I just wondered if you could confirm to the community council that you've set back the corners a little bit to make sure that the sight lines are protected. And that's why uh, we don't have in the report before us uh, any concerns from staff about sight lines. This is really about the fence height along one axis. Um, could, could you just confirm that to the community council? Because they haven't been out to see it. Yes, that that is correct. Um, apparently, I'm just under uh, half a meter too high. When the fence was put in by the fence company, they did check with the bylaws and it was deemed that it was the side of my property, not the front. But uh, mm -hmm. after having uh, the bylaw people come out, they said that they considered the side of my property the front of my property. So I did not know that, nor did the fence company. Otherwise, this would never have gone down the way it did. And um, it, uh, it, the fence is there mainly for um, security and uh, on the, the side of my house is on Bloor Street. It's quite busy with pedestrians and uh, cars and um, that's why the fence was put there. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Marini. There's one other question I have and I don't know if you have access to it, but it's part of the public record. Uh, there's been some correspondence, and I don't know that everybody involved with the correspondence is going to be on the line today, but um, there's a specific entry here from, I think, a neighbor two doors over along Bloor Street. So it's not uh, it's not the neighbor immediately across the street from you, but but two doors over, and I can't make sense of it because it talks about being adjacent to this fence and that there's a structure attached to it and that it's actually a wall and there were some hazards. Do you know anything about it that could offer some clarity? Because, you know, as counselor, I'd like to try to address these matters and, and make sure people are satisfied. But do you have any perspective on that? I do, actually. Um, a gentleman came yesterday and check, checked. the It's at the side of my house. It's not a structure at all. There is a porch there from uh, going out from my back door. 
And mm -hmm. what, was, what was attached to the porch was some lattice just to offer some privacy. It was not part of the fence. It's not a structure. It doesn't have a roof on it or anything. And um, it, uh, the, the gentleman that came out yesterday said he was perfectly fine with it. Do you know it was the gentleman from the city or was it from, yes. uh, was it, okay. okay. He said he was from licensing, I believe. He had the hard hat on with the city of Toronto on it. That's fine. I just, uh, the, the, and I can read the correspondence because it's a matter that's been filed with the clerk. And, you know, these things are always concerning because they, they say things here. And it says uh, they're the residents of 3928 Bloor Street West. I, I'm literally reading the letter submitted to the community council. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they have an mm -hmm. objection to 2 Charleston Road. It says our residence is adjacent, the north side to the property at 2 Charleston Road. And then they go on about a structure and that they're worried about it. But when I looked at the map, I realized that 3928 Bloor Street is actually a couple of houses over on the other side of Charleston Road. So they couldn't nice physically way. be located. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, the, no, it doesn't. They are not adjacent to me. Um, the back of my house just faces the uh, west side and it's my next door neighbor. And I spoke with them. Uh, when this all began in May, and they had no problem with it at with it at all. So I don't know how the um, the other part, the neighbor that's two over, would, has nothing to do do with them. Like it's understood. I, and I, I wanted to get that clarity because it's important because this letter's here, and it you know it it, it causes mm -hmm. doubt on this. And I and to confirm to the council, the neighbor that you talked about that's perfectly supportive of it is the one that abuts it with their driveway. So they're they're satisfied. They're the physically your neighbors. That is correct. They're the only ones that are affected by the fence at all. There's nobody on the other side, and there's there's uh, the neighbors across Bloor Street, which has no effect on them either. Okay. I, I thank you for your time um, to speak to Community Council. Um, um, that's all the questions, Mr. Chair. Any further questions, the deputy? Seeing none. Thank you. Our next speaker, Marina Maria Amaral. Maria, are you there? Maria? To the chair, this is the host. I provided the speaker with the audio panels and they just need to select connect audio at the bottom of their WebEx panels in order to connect and speak. Um, it doesn't appear like they've done so yet. Okay. Maria, if you can hear that, you have to connect at the bottom of your screen. I've also attempted to connect with the speaker in WebEx chat in order to troubleshoot um, and haven't heard anything from them yet. Okay. Um, maybe we'll hold this one down. By the next item, we'll just deal with it. Is that okay? And of course, you're continuing to. We will, Chair. Okay, so I'll just hold this one down. And, and Mr. Chair, just on a, on we'll a right along. Order, just uh, just so that uh, my colleagues on community council know, Ms. Amaral has submitted a, a letter, uh, which is accessible through the clerk's portal, um, and, and she expresses her concerns over the fence. So at least uh, we know the subject of her deputation if we're not able to uh, hear from her. Yeah. So, Deputy Mayor, I'll just with you know, all the technical issues we're having this morning, I'd just be, I think it would be fair just to give her another much wishes if we can't we'll deal with it but i think we'll just hold it for one item if that's okay okay 2610 request for fence exemption with the toronto missile code chapter 447 21 king george's road we have a number of speakers our first speaker peter brown mr brown are you there sir i am thank you councillor grimes <clears throat> good morning and welcome and you have five minutes to speak thank you uh, good morning councillors and thank you for the opportunity to discuss my client's request for an exemption to one aspect of the pool enclosure bylaw uh, in the interest of efficiency and to ensure I convey all the pertinent information, I'm gonna read a, a document that I prepared. My name is Peter Brown with Bonavista Pools and I am requesting, uh, and I am re representing my client, the homeowner, Larissa Durzo and her husband, Myron uh, Jelinski. Bonavista Pools has been building custom concrete pools in the GTA for 20, uh, excuse me, for 50 years. And we greatly respect the need for the pool enclosure bylaw. I would never participate in any request for exemption to this bylaw that would be in any way unsafe, 
unnecessary or frivolous. This is what I do for a living, and so this is an important part of what I do. The request that we're making today is a straightforward one, and I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to respond to any of your questions, comments, or concerns following my presentation. Uh, and please note that the work has not yet begun on this project. Um, I'm a, we're approaching council first, asking for permission rather than doing the work and then asking for forgiveness. It's important to note that if this exemption is granted, the enclosure that will be built around the proposed swimming pool is complete, uninterrupted, safe, and adhering to all aspects of the pool enclosure bylaw, except for this one uh, exemption that we're requesting. Essentially, um, the pertinent part of the bylaw states that a pool enclosure in Toronto must be set back 1.2 meters or four feet from the water's edge of the pool. So if you picture a fence around a swimming pool, the bylaw says that fence needs to be set back four feet away from it. Common sense, I agree. Uh, we're asking for an exemption to the stipulation for one section of the swimming pool, a 12 foot long section across the far end of the swimming pool. The Durzo Zelensky family live on a small corner lot in Etobicoke and the setback requirements for things like swimming pools on a corner lot are actually quite onerous and restrictive. They would prevent a pool from being installed in really any other orientation or positioning in the backyard. It's not a very big yard. It's not a very big swimming pool. Uh, couple that with the fact that it's a corner lot and um, it gets even tougher to position this thing for them. Essentially, the proposed location is the only possible location and orientation for the swimming pool without asking for an exemption from the corner lot setback requirements. We would like to build the pool right up against a separate garage building that abuts the adjacent street and have that garage serve as part of the pool enclosure. The proposed pool measures only 12 feet by 25 feet. It is not a large body of water, but large enough to provide a source of physical exercise, aquatic therapy, and most importantly, stress relief. Larissa is an ophthalmologist working on the front lines in the medical field, operating on her patients daily mere inches from their faces. The pandemic has been very challenging to say the least for our medical professionals and realistically, the situation with the pandemic is not likely to change anytime soon. Sources of stress relief in the comfort of our own homes is a basic necessity, especially for those that we entrust with our health. And in Larissa's case, our eyesight. At an overall length of 25 feet, this is not a large pool. Shortening it by four feet in order to accommodate the bylaw represents a 16% reduction in the overall size of the swimming pool, leaving it at only 21 feet long. It would hardly be worth the cost of undertaking the project in this case. Having been personally involved in the construction of custom concrete swimming pools in the GTA for over 25 years myself, I'm very familiar with the pool enclosure bylaw and all of its requirements. This one requirement, uh, um, the setback from the water's edge, I've never quite fully understood. I can think of three possible reasons for it. One, is it to give someone that might scale the fence a safe space to land if they climb over the fence, uh, the fence that's meant to keep them out? Well, in this case, the section of pool enclosure we're, we're referring to is not a fence, but rather a 16 foot tall garage. There's no one capable of scaling this building without a ladder. And if they do jump down into my client's backyard, a pool of water would be much safer landing pad than a concrete sidewalk. Uh, number two, is it to provide a safe space to walk around the entire pool to reach someone in trouble? In this case, the pool is only 12 feet wide, easily accessible from three other sides and only five feet deep at its deepest point. In any case, as pool builders, we're allowed to plant a, a, a row of cedar hedges right next to a pool and or do a raised wall with water features. This garage wall is not any different than that. Or three, is it to prevent a garage door or a door or a gate from opening directly into the pool? In this case, there are no doors or windows in the garage building, so this is not a danger. Ultimately, the purpose of the bylaw is to keep people out of a pooling in, in out of a pool area, and this pool enclosure effectively does that. My client would appreciate your uh, consideration, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> I have a question for you. So I, I understand the positioning on the corner a lot. I understand we've been working, uh, our office has been working with you on this. Um, so why can the pool not be shifted? Can you maybe just explain? Is there any way we can put the diagram, get the clerk to put the diagram of the pool up? We got that. Do we have that image or no? If you don't, I'll try to explain. Um, so a corner lot, the side yard setback, which is normally just 1.2 meters, is actually 4.5 meters because it's a corner property. 
So if we could see the diagram, if you could see it, it's not a large property. Um, a 4.5 meter setback from the side lot line would result in an 18 foot long swimming pool. So again, a much smaller body of water than what we're trying to accomplish. Great. Got you. Any other questions for the deputy? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, our next speaker, Larissa Durko. Larissa, are you there? To the chair, this is the host. It doesn't appear that that speaker is connected. Okay, uh, Myron, uh, is Myron connected? They are. Okay, Myron, you're there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Good morning, and you have five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak directly to council. Uh, Mr. Brown has provided some of the, the details around what we're looking for, so I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, from our perspective, we're not looking to do anything which is contrary to safety considerations. We're not looking to do something which will cause a problem for our neighbors. What we're looking for here does not do any of that. Uh, as Mr. Brown has already talked about. I, I want to stress a little bit sort of the, the human side of this. And this, frankly, is for my wife. Um, I never really wanted a pool. It's too, sm it's too small a property for the pool. But for her, it's a stress relief. Um, she, she's an ophthalmologist in the neighborhood. She's got an office at Jane and Bloor. She's a surgeon at St. Joe's. Uh, she's a former head of ophthalmology there. She also teaches at St. Michael's Hospital. She trains residents. She's a subspecialist. She sees patients from, frankly, across the province. She's even had people coming in from Quebec to see her. There are not a lot of people who do what she does. Uh, she's the head of the uveitis service at U of T. She researches. She speaks around the globe. She sees 50 patients a day, sometimes while being on call at two different hospitals. She did that. She's been doing that for years and years and years. During COVID, the stress that she already had got much worse. As everybody was bailing out of town to the extent they could, she was seeing people a couple of inches from her face. She would come home completely stressed out. Her only source to relieve stress is exercise. She used to cycle, so she used to run. She can't do it anymore because of her knees. She's now in middle age. She cycles and she loves to cycle. She's been hit by a car twice while cycling because cycling in town is dangerous. Being able to swim is one of the few things she can do outside. She's an absolute dolphin in the pool and it releases, releases stress for her. So it's really important to her, which is frankly one of the reasons why I finally acquiesced the idea of spending probably too much money for a property of this size to build a pool. It's really important to her. It's important to her physical health and her mental health. That's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Any questions to the deputy? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, are there any further speakers to the item? I don't believe there are. Uh, questions of staff? Uh, speakers, this is in my ward. Again, my, my staff have been working with the applicant here. You've heard Mr. Brown, who's built many pools in the area, and uh, he wouldn't recommend this to any of his, uh, any of his clients if he thought it was unsafe, and I'm, I'm satisfied with Mr. Brown's opinion on it, and I think um, I'm very satisfied. So I'm gonna be moving the exemption uh, on, on 2610, and I haven't got the recommendation for me. Bear with me. Chair, may I speak? I right, do one second, yeah. Um, Councilor Holly, I will, yeah. Bear with me. I just wanna, I'm going back and forth here on my computer. Yeah, I'm going to be moving recommendation number two, okay, to grant the application press exception. Um, that's what I'll be moving. Uh, Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Chair. With a, the greatest degree of respect for the local councillor and recognition of the work that you and your team do, I am going to uh, register my dissent uh, with agreeing um, on this particular pool enclosure. And I do that uh, with deep respect. Uh, I have looked at this file very, very carefully and listened to what was talked about today very, very carefully. Um, I feel very passionately about pool, uh, about uh, pool enclosures and their design and their features um, uh, because of the safety elements. And uh, I, I, um, I need to ensure that um, council does show that this is not necessarily a cut and dry, easy matter. 
uh, and I don't want to set up a precedent with respect to this should it pass. Um, the uh, purpose of the side relief, in my view, is to provide a space of refuge if somebody needs to get out of the pool in an urgent uh, situation. And of course, uh, to provide room for rescue if somebody's in trouble. And, uh, you know, the one thing about closing down a side where you can't pass is you create a U shape. So in order to get to the other side in a rush, even though the pool is of um, a more narrow or more modest width than you typically find, if you had to run around to the other side, you have to go around the entire pool. And uh, it would be my preference and my ask of the homeowners that should this pass that they continue to think about, is there an opportunity to create a larger space along the edge of the garage wall for that particular purpose? Be it, uh, you know, reduce the length of the pool in some modest manner uh, or shift it in some way or seek some sort of um, innovative change in the design to make that happen. Uh, but I feel very strongly about that and I'm going to vote against it, Chair. Uh, for that reason, I think everyone has been thoughtful in this process and I wish you good luck on it. Uh, but I need to make sure that uh, I, I'm on the record of saying that I have concerns with this particular design and uh, and and uh, would like to ensure that there's an objection uh, uh, registered. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Holiday. Any further speakers on the item? So uh, again, this is in my ward. I'm moving at number two to grant the application. All in favor? Sorry, I can't see the I chair. May I have it recorded? There, there. All in favor? I'm sure we can. Yeah, recorded vote. Works. All those in favor of uh, granting the exemption as moved by Councillor Grimes, please indicate how you're voting when I call your name. Councillor Grimes. In favor? Councillor Ford. In favor. Councillor Holliday. Right, Madam Clerk, I'm opposed. Councillor Nunziata. Councillor, so I couldn't hear you good. You're, you have to unmute. Great. In favor. In favor. Councillor Peruzza. In favor. That item carries. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you uh, to the deputies today. Our next item is 2611, a request for fence exemption to the Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447, 37 Frost Street. Uh, I think we have speakers, bear with me. Uh, Sasha Marie Donaldson, Ms. Donaldson yeah. on the phone. Yes, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Good morning. Welcome. You'll find us to speak with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to tell you all why I am in support of the fence exemption. I am the daughter of the residents at 37 Frost Street, and I'm also the mother of two children ages two and a half and eight years old with mild to moderate and moderate to severe autism. Both of my sons are high flight risk, which means the impulsive behavior that make a child wander away due to stressful situations, exploring something interesting, escape overwhelming sensory experiences such as loud noises. They risk getting hurt or even lost. Kids who are nonverbal can't speak or ask for help like my youngest. My children are deemed flight risk and will leave the premises if they see an option to. Both of my sons are overly active and love to climb when they get the chance. I've seen both of my kids climb many fences, and it scares me because they are pretty good at it, seeing that they are flight risk. My eldest child is known for walking away at school and daycare, especially if he is having a hard time. He has walked out of school multiple times to get home and has also tried walking to the bus stop to hop a bus. When he is faced with unfamiliar things that frighten him, he has panic attacks. My youngest son is known to run off and doesn't understand the dangers of running into the streets. He is the type of child that learns when something happens, but even then, he still won't understand because of his autism. He doesn't have the awareness of his surroundings like other kids. I've witnessed multiple times when arriving at his grandma's house that he tries to run towards the street and laughs about it, and it worries me as his mother because he doesn't realize the dangers that come with ongoing traffic. I have observed the amount of speeding vehicles that drive around the bend back and forth sometimes, and it concerns me as a parent if my children were to escape and run off. 
When they are both in the back and front yard, neither me or, or his grandparents have the worry when it comes to them running off because it is enclosed for safety and security reasons. Another reason for the fence is for privacy for when my kids are there. As a mother, I am very protective of my kids and I don't like when strangers and unwanted attention is on them, especially when they may be having a meltdown. My boys don't understand the concept of stranger danger, especially my eldest son. He is too friendly and trusting with people he doesn't know and may walk off given the type of child he is. So by having a tall wooden fence surrounding the back and front yard, it ensures that no one can randomly interact with them and prevents them from walking off with somebody they don't know. The enclosed space that my parents have made for their grandchildren is the perfect size for them to play safely, but also a bit of freedom for them um, to be safe. Um, also, I know that the direct neighbor at 27 Frost Street signed a letter of support for the fence that was sent in with the fence exemption. So as I conclude my presentation, um, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to speak on the behalf of my parents and also my children for why having the fence is beneficial. And I hope you consider the points that I have raised and also keep in mind my children when you're making your decision about the fence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. Uh, questions of the deputy? Seeing none, questions of staff? Seeing none, Councilor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Grimes, and uh, thank you, Sasha, uh, for speaking in front of the committee. Um, I'd like to uh, move to grant the exemption uh, for Sasha and her kids, and uh, particularly the, the property um, right here. Thank you, Councilor Ford. Any further speakers? Seeing none, Councilor Ford's moving recommendation number two to grant the exemption. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 2613, request for fence exempt in the Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 4475, Rome present. Uh, we have a couple of speakers. Gavin Lynch, Mr. Lynch, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning Mr. Lynch. Welcome. You have five minutes to speak to it this morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason for this um, fence height exemption application is due to privacy concerns. Uh, my family, uh, my wife, and two children. Uh, enjoy the use of our backyard. Uh, we've been living here for almost 14 years this month. Uh, we enjoy socializing, entertaining, and playing games and sports in our backyard. Uh, we have excellent relationships with all of our neighbors uh, surrounding us, adjacent and nearby, as the support letters illustrate. Uh, for several years, we've had a uh, uh, strained relationship with our neighbor at number three, Brom Crescent, Mr. Scotia. Uh, in the last year, since we have been working from home, uh, we suspect that our neighbor has triggered five or six uh, 311 investigations against our property for various uh, various reasons, uh, including a report to Children's Aid Society of Toronto regarding child endangerment while we were constructing a shed in our backyard. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak to Councillor Holiday uh, re regarding this, and uh, I thank Councillor Holiday for his time. Uh, to entertain uh, this application. Uh, the frequency of complaints against our, our property and our, our family has increased in the last year um, due to the fact that we are at home for most of the time. Uh, and it, it escalated to a point where we had a, uh, our neighbor, Mr. Scotia, had a security camera pointed over the fence into our backyard. Um, and we engaged the police and Toronto 311 uh, to have the security camera removed. Uh, but that that investigation basically went nowhere, um, and it kind of it bounced back and forth between having the camera up, the camera down, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Scotia can easily and discreetly see into our entire backyard, two of his second story windows, where he can monitor all of our activity and report whatever he wishes to Toronto Police, Toronto three one one, Children's Aid, et cetera. By comparison, the number of 311 investigations launched against neighboring properties uh, surrounding us is zero. Just a second here. Um, the, the overall issue here is that um, the access to uh, Mr. Scotia being able to see into our backyard is creating a severe uh, privacy and personal security issue for my family. Uh, you may not be able to hear it in my voice, but I'm actually I'm uh, emotional about this because uh, we now have two children, and it it bothers me that uh, that our neighbor can uh, 
basically leverage or abuse uh, the city's resources, police, 311, and children's aid uh, to antagonize and harass my family, uh, basically on groundless or um, uh, m malicious uh, investigations. I would like to update uh, the council on one issue that, that came up uh, just in the last month. Uh, on two separate occasions, Mr. Scotia was um, violating the Tor City of Toronto noise bylaw, July 25th and August 2nd. Uh, on both occasions, my family was hosting relatives for outdoor dining in our backyard. Uh, but Mr. Scotia chose to violate the Toronto noise bylaw in favor of antagonizing my family uh, and interrupting our time. I printed a copy of the Toronto noise bylaw and a polite compliance letter uh, and left it in Mr. Scotia's mailbox. Uh, this was unfortunately not taken well by Mr. Scotia, and his retaliation demonstrated this. Uh, later that evening at 9.30, Mr. Scotia watched me leave my house to play hockey at Camlin Ice Sports five minutes away. Upon exiting the arena at 10.45 that night, there were two 23 Division police cruisers waiting for me. Uh, the two officers responded uh, and began questioning me about how much alcohol I had been drinking that day. And they said that a call was made to Toronto police alleging that I had been drinking all day in my backyard before leaving to play hockey. Our family faces an ongoing challenge with Mr. Scotia ranging from spying, intimidation tactics, antagonistic and disruptive behavior, and nuisance to 311, Children's Aid, and Toronto Police. As I mentioned before, we've had six bylaw investigations launched against us in the last year. The privacy fence that we have constructed uh, that exceeds the two meter uh, height violate or height limit, uh, it is attractive, well constructed, and supported by all surrounding neighbors. I ask all of you if Mr. Scotia does not like us so much, why would he object to a privacy fence that truly offers maximum privacy to both neighbors? Or is it to enable his hobby of spying on my family? Uh, we ask for uh, your, uh, your support and we hope that you can appreciate our situation and that the city will choose in favor of a family wishing to go about their lives without disruption or a uh, risk of privacy invasion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any further, any questions of the deputy? Councillor, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and only one, Mr. Lynch. Um, uh, thank you for speaking to us today and providing the background and providing uh, comprehensive submissions that make the, the decision-making process much easier for us. Um, I did notice one panel faces the street. Um, you know, the fence kind of jogs and then takes a 90 degree turn and then heads backwards uh, on your side of the property line. Um, do you have any concerns adding some of the greenery to that one panel so that people driving by can can see the, the, that, the, the nice way that you've treated it? Uh, we have no issues with that. Our, our okay. primary concern is privacy and we have no issues with uh, enhancing the appearance of it if it in ensures that we will have granted an exemption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Our next deputant is uh, Marco Scoser. Is Marco on the line? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Marco. Welcome. You have five minutes to speak with us this morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, discrediting Mr. Lynch's submissions to this council. I'd like to first say we, lo we, do, we do not live in a lawless society. When Gavin built the fence extension, he was clearly aware that it was wrong and against the law, but chose to do so anyway, as he does with a lot of the projects he takes on. So we meet here today, and rather than punish him for breaking the law, we are looking for ways to accommodate him. Laws were created for legitimate reasons. The camera. Camera was put up as a deterrent from Gavin continuously bobbing his head over the fence because Gavin, sorry, Mr. Lynch, must know what's going on in everybody's business, especially mine. There's uh, proof of this from one of the neighbors who told me a few times, what does he want? Why is he watching you? So to uh, discourage his behavior from bobbing his head over the fence, the camera was put up. What Gavin fails to mention is that he did call the police about the camera. The officers attended my home. Very inconvenient. They went to the back. 
They looked at the camera. They saw nothing wrong with it because it follows the fence line and angles towards my side. They didn't ask me to move it. And he also fails to mention that when the officers left, they asked him to redirect his cameras in front of his home away from my property. And uh, that's not the first visit by police that Gavin has arranged for them to come to my home about the cameras. And every time they come, they basically say nothing to me and they, built, they apologize, but they tell him to move his cameras. He also had not mentioned that when he first bought the cameras, they he had one pointing directly into my driveway into my garage for two and a half months. It finally came down when I had to install a spotlight to make the camera ineffective. Letters of support. The letters of support are not dated properly where the signatures are. None of these neighbors are in any way affected by the fence extension. One actually lives across the street and two houses over. So what involvement does this neighbor have? Having had the, the opportunity only to speak to one neighbor thus far, he suggests to me that he was misinformed and manipulated, told that this was nothing to do with me and it was only about him getting to permission to leave the fence up. So he chose to sign it. So let's go to the past where Mr. Lynch has done several things legally or illegally, and I am in turn affected by the consequences. He has no regrets and no regards towards me and any other neighbors as to how his projects affect anybody. He did an entire home renovation. Uh, sir, sir, we're not, we're here to talk about fence exemption. Uh, we're not talking about renovations we stick to the the items we're talking about the fence exemption you have to well, speak to, you have to speak to the fence exemption sir that's yes uh, okay my, my my concern about this is is that uh this will eventually like every other project somehow affect me from the pictures that i see that he's submitted there there's planters there the planters are now going to flood my garage again he he decided years ago to put 40 um to put um, fake grass in his backyard against my will. And in the end, that project compromised my garage, which has to eventually come down at a cost of $40,000. Why shouldn't this happen? My insurance company was here to inspect the garage. They looked at the fence just out of looking and the comment was, Everything must be in order for us to be able to properly insure you. And for what's about to happen in this house in the coming future, the insurance you have ten seconds left. Insurance seconds. must be intact. It devalues my property. The fence is a fire hazard. Okay, thank you, sir. Your time is up. Thank you. Questions of the deputy deputy mayor holiday question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scotia, for addressing the committee today. I just want to make sure that um, um, what I see and understand in the report is accurate. Have you had a chance to look at the staff report in this matter? The staff report from the bylaw officer? Correct. Uh, yes, I did see that. Okay, so in that, there's a photo, uh, I think, of your garage, and a, it looks like a wireless camera. That's uh, that photo is accurate. No, the camera. Followed the fence line. The camera okay. followed the fence line and was angled towards my side of the property to deter Gavin from continuously looking over the fence. The camera so, was actually never even hooked up. And, and to prove this, you can go to the police and you could see their report. And uh, they know about that as well. So I'm I'm looking at a photo. I don't know if you've seen it, and it appears to be from your neighbor's backyard, and I can clearly see the face of the camera in the direction pointed. Has the photo been doctored, or the camera moved? It's it's That's where he's standing to take the picture. And the field of view of that camera is what degrees? Do you know? It was angled along the fence line 
towards my side of the property. If it, if it was doing something wrong, the officer that attended my property, not once, but twice would have said, you have to take it down or you have to move it. And, and there was no, nothing was ever done. Nothing was ever said to me that it was wrong. And, and the purpose again, of that camera into, is to I'm not into these the cameras. We live in a very safe community, sir. And, and it wasn't even hooked up. It was there just to deter Gavin. I see. So it was, I, I understand. Okay, thank you. Um, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilor Nunziata. Just a question. So from what I've heard from your deputation is that you don't want your neighbor, Mr. Lynch, to look over to your backyard, uh, that you um, uh, want privacy and uh, as far as the camera. So as far as increasing the height of the fence that Mr. Lynch uh, has uh, has proposed, would that not help you because he can't see over to your property? So I don't understand why you're opposing this if you have an issue with him looking over into your backyard. It doesn't it's make an any sense to me. So if you're really being harassed, then a high fence would solve the issue. It's an insurance concern. Well, it's, I don't know a, what kind of insurance a, company you have. It's a, it's, it's a fire hazard. If and as well, Mr. Lynch is is uh, very sneaky behavior, and with that greenery he has up, he could be standing there, and I know he has been. While I've had guests, and he listens to us talk, he watches us, and there's no clear sight of him. And he could also put up a camera, which he's done in the past, behind the greenery, which I will have no way of seeing. Okay, th thank you. Thank you. You're thank welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, the deputy, um, questions of staff? Sorry. Questions of staff? Councillor Councillor Holly to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to move to grant the exemption and I'm going to ask uh, that the condition be applied uh, that Mr. Lynch uh, just install a bit of greenery on the one panel that faces the street. I think that would improve it. Um, I know I've talked to Mr. Lynch about this and he answered my question today that he'd be willing to do that. I think that would um, be a helpful thing. Um, the, the photo in the report is quite compelling. Um, I <clears throat> don't understand or would I ever want to desire to live in a situation where there's a camera uh, activated or inactivated pointing along a fence line. Um, and in fact, the picture shows that t a photo taken from the backyard of the neighbor, you can clearly see the lens. So that would indicate that if the camera was on, you would be able to uh, pick up video of someone else's backyard. Um, and to me, that is a, a very compelling reason to grant this fence exemption. Um, my understanding is that uh, it otherwise would only be monitoring, you know, a small space between a garage and a fence, right? So that's not, is not put up there for any other purpose other than to look along that fence line as uh, the gentleman described. Uh, but unfortunately, um, a side effect of that is there has to be some spillover. Um, so uh, uh, fence exemption granted, um, I, and I, I just regret that this is really, in something that this community council can't solve. Uh, you know, it's clear that there's a lot going on between these neighbors. All of us members of council see this come up from time to time. And uh, this tension manifests itself in things like fence exemptions. Uh, I really hope uh, the neighbors can work it out. Um, and uh, I, I see the level of, of tension there. If, uh, if I can be of assistance in any way to refer uh, folks to community mediation, or some other service that might be able to get through these differences, I think uh, that would contribute to a lot more peace in the neighborhood. Uh, but in this particular case, um, um, I, I, I believe the right answer is, is to uh, provide that exemption and uh, build a fence that uh, nobody uh, either side can look over. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Seeing no further speakers, Councillor Holliday is moving number two to grant the uh, exemption. All in favor? Opposed? <clears throat> carried. So just some housekeeping. I think I skipped over 12, Councillor Ford tells me. But on my list, I don't have any speakers for 12. Nancy, do we have speakers on number 12? Uh, there are no speakers. No speakers. Okay, so request for fence exemption to the Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 44741, Hollow Crescent, Councillor Ford. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm going to move to grant uh, the exemption. Um, if members of community council have looked at this item, it is a little bit um, unusual. Um, but I took a moment uh, to go pay the homeowner a visit uh, probably a few months back um, to take a look at this particular situation. I think um, there's a significant grade difference between um, a multi-residential uh, unit um, on the other side of his backyard um, with a significant grade difference. Um, so the, the resident shared with me that he's doing this for privacy. Um, I, I asked him about any opposition in the community. Uh, he said there's no opposition. His neighbors are okay with it. Um, and our office hasn't heard of any opposition. Um, so I'm prepared to uh, grant uh, this uh, exemption. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Councillor Ford is moving recommendation number two to grant the exemption. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, and some further housekeeping. Councillor Peruzza, uh, you've added uh, EY 26.32. We have to add it. I need a motion. And if you could just, Councillor Peruzza, I don't have the title in front of me. Could you just, the title of uh, EY 26.32, what's the title? Um, you know what? I'm I'm trying to look it up. I I I am not sure that there is a title. It's just a it's just a, a memo. Nancy, is there a see. title on that? I, have I don't have a copy that? of it. The item is a request to reopen EY 2413. Oh, reopen. It's a request for a fence exemption to the Toronto Municipal Code Chapter 447 for 102 Lamar Avenue uh, Lamar Drive. So 2632. Is that what we're talking about? That is correct. We have to add 2632, Councillor Okay. It's, it's, so a, a it's a real. We need to add 2632 to the agenda. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. So that's added, Councillor Prutza. The other one, um, Nancy said that you should be talking to transportation about your speed limit. So I think she's probably sent you a message to talk to transportation on how you want to deal with reduction in speed limits. Okay. Sure. So those are your two items, but we've added 32 to the agenda for you. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Moving right along. Let's go back to, um, bear with me. Back to number 26.9. I believe we were trying to get a hold of uh, Maria Amaral, correct? And we did not get a hold of her to the clerks. We did not get a hold of Maria. To the chair, this is the host. That's correct. I attempted to okay. communicate with the speaker in WebEx chat, um, and we also, uh, I also emailed them, um, and I have heard no reply. Great. Thank you very much. So, seeing no further speakers, questions of staff. Uh, we're talking about uh, not to Charleston Road. Seeing that none, uh, Council uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair Grimes. Uh, I am going to move to grant the fence exemption. Um, and I will only uh, make the following comment that uh, I am troubled with some of the submissions that were made. And I regret we weren't able to speak to the resident that opposed the application in her letter to us. Um, I believe that uh, she's across the street. Um, it is puzzling um, that a, a letter came in talking about abutting concerns with a structure, um, but the individuals live on the other side of the house across the street. And so it just doesn't end up when you add the addresses and plot them on a map. So something is amiss here. If uh, the residents have a chance to see this video and want to talk to me, you know, give me a call. I want to make sure that any safety issues are are addressed. I'm not sure that they're necessarily connected with the fence exemption application. Um, and unless those structures are abutting the two fences which face the road, uh, they absolutely have nothing to do with the fence exemption before us because those uh, those other fences aren't in question. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, I always prefer that uh, people follow the fence bylaw, but I understand there's some complicating factors in this case. Um, the setbacks and the sight lines have been protected. Uh, otherwise, they're not in the report, and I have spoken to MLS about that, and this comes down to aesthetics. Uh, it is a 1.2 meter uh, requirement versus a 1.8 meter tall fence. Uh, so the delta is, uh, is, is um, minimal in this case. Fence is neat and tidy and um, and does fit in as uh, as indicated uh, in some of the correspondence. So with that, I hope you'll support my uh, my um, my motion to approve. Rashid, uh, thank Rashid you. Rashid was Natalie able to receive. Councilor Project, thank you. 
Okay, so seeing no further speakers, Councillor Holliday is moving the um, the number two, the exemption on two Charles Road. All in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Moving right along, 2614, request for fencing exempt the Toronto Missile Code, Chapter 447, 68 Burroughs Avenue. We have one speaker registered, Alistair Jenkins. Is Alistair Jenkins on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Good morning, sir. Welcome. And you have five minutes to speak with us this morning. The floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you. I did, um, in the submission, provide um, fairly detailed drawings um, and also uh, multiple photographs, uh, including a proposal with respect to the addition of an 18-inch lattice to the top of the existing um, fence. Um, I'm here to um, obviously request the exemption. The reason for this, as you'll see from um, the photographs I've supplied, is that the uh, property 68 boroughs has um, significant windows um, facing um, my neighbor. Um, they have a deck that comes off their first floor that is um, three feet off the ground, which means that the fence um, to fence line of sight only really is a, effectively a three foot above that deck level. Um, both us, there is a supporting letter from my neighbor um, next door that um, supports um, uh, the addition of this um, lattice to the top of the, at the top of the structure, because it will provide them with privacy and ourselves with privacy. Um, there are no issues between us, but both of us would appreciate um, being allowed to raise that um, fence by uh, uh, the addition of a lattice to the top as shown in the drawings. I'd be happy to answer any questions or if there are any uh, requests by council members to do that. Um, and I'll just make it brief unless there are questions, but if I can reserve the right to respond to those questions, if there are any, um, but hopefully you'll be, you'll see fit to approve the, uh, the extension. Thank you very Thank much. You, Mr. Jenkins, uh, questions of the deputy. Uh, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Jenkins, thank you for coming today. We haven't had an opportunity to speak. Uh, may I just confirm you're the, the either the resident or the owner of 68 boroughs? Um, I am both the resident and the owner. Okay. And uh, from what I gather from the drawings, um, you're looking to put a limited uh, length along that fence access uh, and increased height for the reasons you mentioned, the, the differences in the, uh, or sorry, the the raised deck elements on both houses to uh, add some privacy. Correct. Okay. Um, there is some correspondence from a neighbor, um, but I, I uh, but I, it does not appear that this fence intersects with any other properties other than your immediate neighbor um, that you describe with the raised deck. Uh, that is correct. Okay. And your neighbor is in full support of this. Uh, they are. Excellent. Um, thank you. I did have a chance to drive by last night and uh, I tried to visualize the fence and it, it is uh, very minor in nature. I think what you're asking for. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no other questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Hall. Any further questions? The deputy. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. No seeing no further speakers. Questions of staff. Seeing none. Deputy Mayor Hall, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am prepared to move um, to grant the exemption. And would make the comment that uh, the two neighbors that are affected uh, appear to be in agreement, and this uh, this application is minor in nature, and uh, I, I have no other concerns. Seeing no further speakers, Councillor Holiday is moving to grant the uh, the uh, exemption. All favor? Opposed? Carried. Back to housekeeping. I have to reopen. I'm sorry. Twenty six point two uh, the trillion Sherway. I forgot to move the supplementary report. So motion to reopen twenty six point two. All in favor? Opposed carried. I will move the supplementary report recommendations. All in favor? Opposed carried. Item is amended. All in favor? Opposed carried. Uh, now to 2616, request for fence exception, the Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447, 54 Fremont Avenue. We have a speaker, Maria Tuchachi. Maria, is Maria on the line? Good to answer any questions. Um, just wanted to highlight that uh, uh, the neighbor um, uh, right next door who I'm sharing this fence with uh, is very supportive and uh, I've provided the letter of support in my original submission. But generally, uh, I'm asking for this exemption for um, um, mostly for privacy, um, given that I have a, um, a hot tub and the, the difference in the grade level between our houses uh, makes it uh, a bit difficult to uh, to hide behind a, a smaller fence. Um, 
So if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions of uh, Maria? Uh, Deputy Rahalde? Thank you for Maria, uh, Maria for your patience. Uh, I know it's a long meeting and um, um, I think you covered it well in your brief comments and uh, uh, you and I have had a chance to look at this fence together. Um, I wondered if you could confirm from my colleagues that the exemption is actually quite limited in, in amount. It's just a small section of the fence uh, and very minor in nature. And as you pointed out, there's a, there's some big slopes between you and the neighboring property. And I believe, uh, I think you told me before that the neighbor that uh, is in between your backyard and their yard where this fence is, is in full support. That is correct. Uh, and when someone came to, from the city to check the fence, they said that it was just one section right next to the hot tub that uh, required the exemption. Uh, excellent. And again, thank you for your patience. I know we had to defer this item, but uh, the, the homework was necessary to do uh, leading up to this council meeting. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of the deputy? Seeing none. Thank you. Questions of staff? Seeing none. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to move to grant the exemption. And uh, thank everybody involved for their time and their patience on this. Um, we may recall it came before council at the beginning of summer, and uh, there was a there was a clerical issue with the report, and just required me to spend some time on it. And uh, the resident has uh, been very accommodating to let me go have a look at the fence. And uh, I believe that uh, my colleagues on community council should support it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Holly. Uh, Deputy Mayor Holly is moving to uh, grant the exemption. All in favor. Opposed, carried. And sorry if I call a little rusty today. I, I think we skipped over 15. I'm um, going off my entity, but we have no speakers on 15. But I think I skipped over it. Um, so there's no speakers on 15. Uh, 62 Clement Road, uh, Councillor Holiday. Uh, questions of staff? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, anybody else questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Holiday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm going to ask uh, the indulgence of my colleagues to defer this matter. Um, in the preliminary work, uh, it is um, appearing to be contentious and complicated, and I'm going to need a little bit of time to sort through it. Uh, so with that, I will uh, place a motion to defer to next day. Okay, the motion to defer to next day. All, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, now, so I might need some help here, Nancy. We're now on to the new business. Um, I don't have numbers on, on my annotated. If you can maybe give Chair, me the number. Mr. Chair, I, yeah. believe that item, I believe that item 28, there's a presentation by count uh, by staff. Uh, um, yes, there is. But just I want to just try to get this new business sort of. So, um, Councillor Grimes, uh, Nancy here. Uh, yeah. Item, hi, Nancy. hi, EY 2617 has not yet been dealt with. Okay, let me go back there. Happy to approve a private tree 24 Greenfield Drive. <clears throat> that was tied for 10 15. Uh, I have to go back to my speakers list. Bear with me. Uh, again, I don't have any speakers on 15. Are there speakers on 15? The clerks? This is item 17. There are no speakers. 17, no speakers. Okay. Are there questions of staff? Bear with me. Okay. Uh, no questions of staff. And no speakers. Um, Okay, I'm just going to move the staff recommendations then uh, that are before us to deny the request to remove the tree. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, so I guess we'll go down to the presentation. Um, if Nancy, just give me some numbers, I guess, on the new business that we have to do. I don't have numbers on them, but uh, we'll go to item 28, I believe. Is that correct, Nancy? Uh, the presentation is item 28, and then we have new business that's been added to the agenda, items 30, 31, and 32. And we dealt, we haven't dealt with 29 yet. We have dealt with 29, have we not? Yes, we have, right? <clears throat> yes, 29 has been dealt with. Yeah, 
Okay, so we'll go to 26.28, the, the economic development culture initiatives for Etobicoke, New York. We have a presentation from staff. Thank you, Councilor Grimes. It's Joanne Pin speaking here, and this is a presentation from the economic development and culture division on some of the initiatives that we are doing in both Etobicoke and New York. So I am the acting director of Museums and Heritage Services. However, Cheryl Blackman, who's our acting general manager, is away this week, and so I'm filling in for her. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tobias Novogrodsky, the acting director of the Business Growth Services section within Economic Development and Culture. Nice to be here this morning with you all. So, Larissa, if you could advance the slide, please. So, I sorry, this is the host. I apologize for the interruption. Uh, to Larissa, if you could please select a display settings and then select switch view. Uh, right now, we're getting uh, your view. Yes, thank you. And Larissa, if you could advance there, great. So, first, we'd like to provide some background information on the division for any of you who may not be familiar with with our work. And then next, we'll discuss EDC's strategic foundations and quickly run through some of the important strategies and plans that guide our work. We'll highlight some of the initiatives that we've been working on in your wards. And finally, we'll discuss our priorities for your areas for 2022. And we're hoping there'll be enough time for questions at the end, but I know you've got a full agenda. So, if not, we can be available, of course, afterward. Next slide, please. So, the economic development and culture division is responsible for a broad range of activities that are led and implemented out of its five sections. We're just showing four here because these are the public facing ones. The so business growth services, which helps Toronto businesses maximize their opportunities through a range of programs and services that target entrepreneurs, medium and large sized businesses. And BGS is also responsible for the business improvement areas. Film and entertainment industries support all aspects of the city's film, music, tourism, and entertainment industries. Arts and culture services consults and advocates for the city's cultural industries. It produces major cultural events and arts programs, runs the public art program, and provides support to arts institutions. And Museums and Heritage Services operates 10 historic sites and leads the development and restoration of about 100 city owned culture and heritage buildings. The fifth section, which isn't showing on the slide, is program support. And that's sort of the glue that holds all the pieces together. They lead marketing, sponsorship, finance, technology solutions, people services, policy development, and research for the four public facing areas of the slide. So if you could advance again, please. Prior to the onset of COVID-19, the city, this division's work was guided by two important documents. One is the City of Toronto Corporate Strategic Plan, and the second is the Economic Development and Culture Division's Strategic Plan. And while these two plans still underpin, underpin all of our work, two important documents developed and released during the pandemic have guided our response to help Toronto toward economic recovery. And those are the Toronto Office of Rebuild and Recovery Report, and the building back strong report. Next slide, please. So this slide shows how the strategic priorities to invest in people and neighborhoods guides all of EDC's work. We strive to improve the quality of life for all Torontonians and visitors to Toronto, and to ensure that we have a vibrant and growing economy throughout the city. EDC's strategic plan includes four strategic goals and eight key objectives. And the goals we focus on are inclusion and equity, talent and innovation, space and access, and operational excellence. So you can see from the slide that combating economic and cultural disparity and improving participation in city-led cultural economic opportunities falls under inclusion and equity, although we do have a lot of cross-pollinization of all these um, strategies. Under talent and innovation, we 
We focus on improving industry competitiveness for emerging and established businesses and culture sectors and enabling the workforce to respond to new opportunities and challenges. Other space and access, we improve access and affordability of space for businesses and for cultural institutions, and we increase access to city owned spaces, providing stakeholders with places to interact. And then finally, for operational excellence, we foster and maintain a culture of public service innovation and excellence and deliver exceptional, equitable, and accessible customer service to all the EDC partners. I'm going to hand off to Tobias here for the next set of slides. Thanks, Joanne. So following the release of EDC's divisional strategy back in 2018, and recognizing that prosperity broadly considered mm -hmm. and equity are linked, the division developed an equity plan, which includes seven goals and 38 actions. The goals of this plan are listed here, and you can see that they relate largely to how, with whom, and for whom we provide services and programming. So, for example, some of the key equity plan goals include commitments to increase diversity in our workforce advisory bodies and suppliers, integrate equity and diversity into our EDC space and programming, and of course, reach and engage Indigenous and equity seeking communities and underserved neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So, building back stronger, the report of the City of Toronto's Economic and Culture Recovery Advisory Group which was comprised of 20 distinguished community political and business leaders, was considered by City Council back at its meeting in December of 2020. And at that time, Council adopted a recommendation directing that this report, the Build Back Stronger report, be forwarded to the City Manager for review and implementation as part of the City's ongoing COVID-19 recovery efforts. So the recommendations from this important report, which are organized into the four themes you see on this slide, inform and align well with the work that we are focused on as a division. At a broad level, using the tools and resources we have available to us and informed by the Building Back Stronger Report's recommendations, EDC is and will continue to work to deliver strategic actions to help businesses reopen, expand, and thrive, while of course safeguarding the public against the risk of infection. We'll be developing specific interventions to make meaningful structural change and ensure that Black, Indigenous, and equity-deserving groups have better access to the city's economic and cultural benefits. We'll be developing collaborative approaches to workforce development and skills training to make Toronto talent among the most competitive in the world. And of course, advance opportunities to support arts, arts and culture. Next slide, please. When you bring a bunch of these plans together, uh, our focus as a division, um, it becomes clearer. So in light of the devastating impacts that COVID-19 has had on Toronto's economy, and in particular on those disadvantaged, EDC's focus in 2021, so the back end of this year and through next year, will be on actions that support inclusive economic and cultural recovery. So despite efforts from all levels of government, the pandemic has had serious impacts on certain groups of workers and certain types of businesses and cultural industries in Toronto. For example, restaurants, personal care services, and many other small retail-based businesses, as we all know, have faced extensive closures <clears throat> and uncertainty, and tourism accommodation and hospitality have been hard hit. So as a result, in addition to focusing in the near term on safe reopening, Priorities for 2021 and 22 for EDC will be on supporting inclusive economic and cultural recovery. Why? Because economic growth without an intentional focus on equity is not full prosperity. It's not sustainable and it could leave our community vulnerable to future economic shocks. So building back better or building back stronger, if you will, has to mean that we are both driving equity through prosperity and prosperity through equity. And the focus areas outlined in our divisional strategy are now as are, are as relevant now as they were pre-COVID, and they're closely aligned with the recommendations that have come forward through council, through the TOR report and the Building Back Stronger reports. Next slide, please. Next slide. So on the next couple of slides, what we'd like to do is to highlight some examples of the initiatives that the EDC division has been working on 
in Etobicoke and York. And we'll begin uh, with some highlights from the Arts and Cultural Services section, which has a number of projects underway in Etobicoke, York. And they're listed here, some examples. And they include <laughs> things like providing support to the Nielsen Park Creative Center to assist with public safety issues, the recent installation of a monument to Joshua Glover uh, in Joshua Glover Park, down at Assembly Hall through the Make RTO program, we're offering online workshops by the big, sorry, by the Lake Book Club events and affordable rental programs. We fund, as you know, local art service organizations, including Lakeshore Arts, Urban Arts, and Arts Etobicoke. The 2021 cultural hotspot continues to celebrate arts, community, and culture with five signature and spark partnership projects. And over in Mimico Creek, uh, support resumed to produce, fabricate, and install uh, a Noel Harding public artwork over at the southwest corner of Dundas West and Islington. And that project is slated for completion towards the end of next year. And there will also be an Artworks TO Etobicoke Community Hub established at the Cloverdale Mall. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm not seeing if the slides are advancing. So I'm gonna keep speaking in the interest of time. Um, hopefully you can see the slides uh, in short order. So from a business growth services perspective, uh, this section mm -hmm. has been focused on both safe reopening and recovery activities. So for example, in support of safe reopening, we've been distributing rapid testing kits since June 18th to businesses through a partnership with the Toronto Region Board of Trade. And one of our four distribution sites is of course located at the Etobicoke Civic Center. Uh, since this program was initiated back in June, more than 1,600 businesses representing almost 40,000 employees have received testing kits uh, through this program. Um, obviously, our BIA office uh, continues to provide ongoing support to all the BIAs in your area and to support and advance various parquet improvements, new gateways, and a number of streetscape improvements. As you also likely know, the municipal conversion request uh, is an area that we work in. Uh, we are providing input and support to the city to city planning on the existing municipal comprehensive review process, which is underway with a view to the preservation and protection of employment lands. Uh, our, our group in this section is also involved in the development of local economic development strategies. We have an example listed here, obviously the Mount Dennis economic development strategy uh, has been a, a focus of ours in, in the last little while, uh, which seeks to support business and job growth in Mount Dennis and leverage major transit infrastructure investment that's underway in the area. We have a new pilot community economic development grants program underway this year, and uh, Mount Dennis has recently received uh, a grant uh, in partnership and through the Learning Enrichment Foundation to support a bike hub and bike training initiative for residents in the area. We support local studies and initiatives. Some examples are listed here, the Finch West Goods Movement Study, Pearson Employment Area Pilot Zone Study as well. And through our Gold Star Assistance Program, we support major development and construction projects for new businesses or established businesses. Some important new developments for companies in the region are uh, in your area are listed here. There's of course the Pure Later Ontario Hub, two new Metro supermarket warehouse distribution centers and 400,000 square feet of industrial and warehouse buildings uh, on the former Campbell Soup lands. We're also involved in the Jane Finch Initiative, developing an integrated plan for the area that advances both social equity and economic inclusion for current and future area residents. And we support ongoing administration of the city's IMIT program. I'll turn it back to Joanne. This is the host. If Joanne is currently speaking, uh, they are muted. My apologies. Um, film and entertainment industries section has a large number of active programs, programs in Etobicoke and New York, including the XOTO Screen Industries Pathways, which is an expansion of training programs for Black, Indigenous, and people of color across Toronto. There's extensive information about this 
program on careers in film, which is on toronto.ca. And that provides information for all entry points to the industry, film production roles, and also industry hubs in Toronto. Show Love TO is the umbrella program and campaign that will be launching on September 14th. And that brings cultural animation to the streets, builds public confidence and people to re-engage with the city and supports local shops and restaurants. And then within Show Love TO, we've got Stroll TO, which is self-guided tours of 25 neighborhoods covering each Toronto ward. And this will be expanded to include 140 neighborhoods in its next iteration. We have Poems for Your Path, which is in select Stroll TO neighborhoods. We've got Messages of Strength, Hope and Resilience, and they'll be displayed as colorful text-based art installations in those, in those neighborhoods. We have a program called No Vacancy, which is a citywide program to animate storefronts. And it's partnering with the BIAs and with local arts and cultural organizations. Lo Love TO is a program to generate local tourism for the Main Street businesses. And it's adding lighted three-dimensional hearts on the streets in each Toronto ward. Big Art TO is a 10-week program across all 25 city wards, activating sites with public art installations. Many of them are film-based. And then we have Dine Together, which is a promotional campaign to encourage Torontonians to support local restaurants. In addition, we have the City, ha city Hall Live Spotlight, which is part of our music program. The 2021 program is complete, but uh, public health guidelines willing we'll be doing it again in 2022. And this is a weekly series of professionally produced live stream videos showcasing local musicians performing across different music venues. Um, music 331 is the city of Toronto where we have assembled a playlist of original music written and recorded by Toronto-based artists for coal hold playback on the city's 331, 311 customer service line. And next slide, please, Rosa. And the Museums and Heritage Services. Um, the Div Divisions Museum and Heritage Services section has many active projects in Etobicoke, York as well. So starting with the Dunda Street renaming, this is, we're developing a tra tra transition plan to support Dunda Street businesses through the street renaming. The Little Jamaica project, EDC is working with city planning, undertaking a study of this area that's intended to support and celebrate this important cultural corridor. And this is where the Show Love TO launch is gonna be taking place on Tuesday. Montgomery's Inn, we have a number of activities. There's a highly successful community farmer's market that's held weekly throughout the year. We have historic TO walking tours and interior tours once we're able to reopen to the public fully. We have the Vibe Arts Prospect Project, which is the creation of a community artwork at Montgomery's Inn through August and September. So we've got another few weeks for that. And then we have a number of capital projects. Still at Montgomery's Inn, we're replacing the cedar roof on the historic building, and we'll be completely renovating the commercial kitchen to expand community uses of that facility, including our uh, Indigenous community and also the Black Food Sovereignty Program, which will be integrating into the activities of this commission at Montgomery's Inn. At Franklin Carmichael Art Gallery, we're also replacing the roof on the garden studio, and we're decommissioning an old cistern, which has some health and safety implications for the, for the site. In 2022 and 2023, we'll begin a major state of good repair restoration at the assembly hall. And then finally, with Awakenings, this is a virtual program that tells Toronto's many stories through a series of art projects by Black, Indigenous, and artists of colour. And in 2022, the Awakenings program is also going to be offered at Montgomery's Inn again as part of a Soul Pepper mentorship program we're doing, where selected BIPOC performance artists will create site-specific work for each of Toronto's 10 historic museums. If you could advance the slide again, please. We'll go to Cafe Tio. And this is a Cafe Tio expansion which we're enhancing the communication outreach efforts that we've been making for this program. We'll be leveraging the city's newsletter and social distribution channels. 
We're providing information about expanding patios on private property. So this is a temporary use bylaw for patios on private property. Property will be required. We're supporting additional councillor communications so that this program can be promoted even more. The city is hosting webinar supports for restaurants and for bar operators. And we're engaging community partners for patio furniture donations for sponsorship and for discounts. So next slide, please, Larissa. So the additional 2022 priorities we have are to advance inclusive business and cultural recovery efforts. We want to implement and expand place-based community economic development projects as well through business, film, arts, and museums. We want to implement the grant reform to ensure public funding is equity, equitably distributed to those in business and culture sectors with the greatest need. And this is a project that's been ongoing for a couple of years now to, to ensure that we're more equitable in the way that the city's funding is distributed. Lots of uh, smaller groups have access to this. We're continuing our advocacy to enhance support for other orders of government for business and culture recovery. We're going to continue to implement EDC's equity plan, which Tobias described really clearly ensures equitable access to economic and cultural opportunities for all Torontonians. And we're going to renew the strategic and policy guidance for EDC through the development of a new five-year divisional strategic plan as, as the one that we're working on now comes to a close in 2022. And final slide, I think, is thank you. Um, is there any questions from any of the members of the council? We thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Tobias. Any questions of uh, staff? Seeing none. Oh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, definitely. Mr. Stephen Holiday, if I'm if I may ask, um, I, I'm not sure who to direct it to, but um, maybe Mr. Novogrodsky um, mentioned the lassos. Um, would it be correct to say that arts funding to Etobicoke's lassos, uh, that would be Lakeshore Arts and Etobicoke Arts, were cut this year? So through the chair, I'm sorry, I don't have that uh, information at hand. I'm looking to some of my, my colleagues. Um, it's an important question. And if I don't get the answer from a colleague shortly, I'm happy to get back to you. It's not, not I'll my... tell you what, would you believe me if I told you it was? I, uh, I, I, I would believe you. Okay. Um, so do, does EDC have a plan to help Lakeshore Arts and Arts Etobicoke? And, and it's okay if you can't answer me today and just tell me that, but, um, you know, uh, uh, I think collectively members of this council would be interested, this community council would be interested in, you know, how the, the lassos are funded and what the future is for them. Um, or could you uh, could you come back to us and tell us more about that? Yeah, I'm sure we can come back and, and talk to you more about that. And you know, certainly we kind of in, you know gestured at it in in the overview slides. But we know that the arts sector and residents and businesses that are attached to the arts sector have been disproportionately impacted through this pandemic, and that the existing mechanisms we have to support lassos and other arts based organizations are going to be important as part of the city's broader recovery efforts. So we're happy to provide uh, further information. Um, we do understand that minor reallocations uh, were made this year to achieve a more equitable, equitable distribution of funding across LASSOs. Uh, so the, uh, the pot may have had to be adjusted this year, which may have resulted in certain organizations receiving less funding, but on the whole, well, we certainly recognize the importance of this area and are happy to come back and provide further information about our approach to funding arts organizations, including the lassos. Yeah, so if I, and, and clerks will have to forgive me because I need a moment to, to pen this out, but if, if I asked you to come back to community council to talk about how we compare as a section of the city compared to others with respect to access to funding for our lassos and for other community organizations that provide arts related services, you know, could we see on, I don't know if it's a per capita base, uh, uh, basis or a, you know, a square meter or, you know, whatever it is, you know, do we, do we have um, equitable allocation uh, in Etobicoke and do we have equitable coverage as, a, as compared to other parts of the city? 
you know, I'd love to get that report out there and for uh, members of this uh, community council to see that, um, you know, that things are, are working well or, or maybe need to have a path for something a little different. If I asked you for that kind of report, could you come back to us uh, yeah, I'm in sure. a reasonable amount of time? I, I'm sure we're able to provide additional information about the the criteria that are used to inform those funding decisions and what the current state of that allocation looks like <laughs> and, and okay. show it in different forms. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if I could just ask, you know, uh, I'll let the others go, but if, if we need a moment, if you could hold this item down just so I get a proper motion put together. Well, Council Deputy Mayor Holiday, listen, I know my good boy there, Tobias there, um, he says he's going to bring a motion back. He can bring it back. I don't think you need a motion, but if you'd like to move one, but I know Tobias would be more than happy to bring that forward. And uh, um, I, I don't think we need a motion. Tobias, are you okay with uh, not having a motion? I think we've heard the the councillor's uh, request uh, to provide additional information in this area. So whether it's your choice, whether you want to move the motion, but uh, we're certainly apprised of the interest in the topic and are happy to yep. provide. Yep. Deputy Mayor, I know where Tobias lives, so listen, no problem. We'll get that. We'll get that report, right, <laughs> if, Tobias? If it's all right, uh, Mr. Chair, if it could just be in consultation with me, I just I want to ask the right question. Yeah. And uh, you know, I can take it offline to to um, confirm that that right question and exchange emails with uh, Mr. Novogratsky is not a problem. And I, I'm satisfied with your guidance that you know we don't okay. need to put a motion today. Take the doc Tobias, you put me on the spot now. Okay, Councillor Nunzi had a question. Yeah, I just um, um, I just have a couple questions. Uh, well, first of all, uh, what uh, Councillor Holiday was talking about the arts. If you can include urban arts in that as well, that's in uh, that's in City of York um, as part of that report as well. Um, one thing that I didn't see on the list, um, in particular with Mount Dennis. Uh, so Mike Williams, before he retired, he started a project in Mount Dennis uh, with my res uh, residents and we are working with the economic development on, on a, a campus in the Mount Dennis area. So I don't see that on the list on projects that uh, you're working on. So through the chair, thank you, Councillor, for the question. And I think there was a bit of a, a glitch. I think that slide was shown very quickly. So uh, in the presentation, you will see a reference to the uh, the Mount Dennis Economic Development Strategy. And there is a note that we're working closely with business and educational stakeholders in the community to bring a post-secondary facility to Mount Dennis. So as you know, our staff are working closely uh, with okay. your office and others in the community on this. And it is listed on that slide. I just think it was uh, it, it passed quickly. But it's okay. Not. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was part of the list. I guess I missed it because okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you to staff. A great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along to new business. I believe it's twenty six point three zero installation of speed cushions on Tranbridge Crescent. Uh, Councillor Ford. Mr. Chair, can I just have questions of transportation staff for? Yes, you may. Uh, <clears throat> I think Bruce Clayton's here on the line somewhere. Bruce, you there? There he good is. Good morning. Great. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Clayton. Um, so um, we, we've been working together in my office and you folks on, on this uh, item. Um, the speed cushions that we're looking to install, um, and maybe I'll give some context to members of the committee when I speak, um, but uh, with the speed cushions, um, transportation is okay with this, moving ahead with this, correct? Yes, through the chair we are. Um, it's, it's not been installed before within the city of Toronto, um, so it's going to be a somewhat of a pilot project, um, uh, but we are supportive of the use of these in, in this location. Okay, thank you. And it will need uh, city council approval, correct? I know we were going back and forth on uh, who, um, if, if we have delegate authority or has to go to city council. Correct, because there's a TTC on this, on Tandridge, it does have to go to council. And, and, and to be honest, this is the reason why speed cushions are being considered here is because of the TTC. Um, and, uh, but it does have to go to council. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Quinn. Uh, Mr. Chair, those, those are my uh, questions. Any further questions of staff? Councilor Nunziata? 
so Bruce, uh, if this is a pilot, uh, so in other wards where uh, we have bus routes, uh, would that uh, would we be able to request that in other wards as well? Yeah, through the chair, eventually, um, we're not opening it up to all other streets with TTC, but you're correct, Councillor, this this does will cover quite a few streets that have TTC who have been previously uh, limited to what traffic calming options are out there. This is now going to be a new traffic calming option. However, what I'd caution is this has not been tested with the TTC yet, and that's one of the big things we're going to try here on Tandridge is to see how their buses negotiate these speed cushions. So while speed cushions are new to Toronto, they've been used in other jurisdictions such as Mississauga. It's just, it's, it's something new we're trying in Toronto. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday. Hey, Mr. Chair, I, could, could Mr. Clayton tell us what a speed cushion is? Yeah, if I could share my screen, I could pull something up, but essentially it, it has a gap in the middle of the speed hump. So picture a, a continuous speed hump with gaps that are are fairly um, see if I can show you here. Not sure if you're viewing my screen or not. Yeah, we can see uh, it. Okay. Um, so I'll show you an example of one in Miss in Mississauga. If you see the picture, it's got a little gap where the bus, the bus, the wheels of the bus can go in between it um, so that it doesn't have that rocking sensation that uh, that it does with a speed hump. So that's the intention okay. of not slowing down TTC and causing that bump. Um, are staff supportive of, of traffic calming on this street? I mean, I, there's no report from you on it. I, I want to be clear on that because it matters to me. Um, is this something that you stand behind? It's something that we are actually doesn't meet the warrants for traffic calming um, during our last count. So it uh, we would not have prepared a positive report for other forms of traffic calming. However, because of the conditions mentioned by Councillor Ford, um, it is something we're trying as a trial. But technically, it does based on our last study, it didn't meet the warrants for traffic calming. Uh, is staff going to be reporting back on this in any way in the future? I, I'm not sure if the report will be through community council uh, or it will be certainly be evaluated. <laughs> and then the decision will be made by our operational planning and policy unit of whether they're going to include it in the traffic calming toolbox. Um, but there has been no specific direction to report back to any community council, but there will certainly be communications back on it, whether this is successful or not. Are these temporary or are they? Are they contemplated as a permanent installation? Well, we're going to see as a trial. So they are installed uh, with the intention of if they're successful, they would stay. Um, however, we don't know yet until we do our, our evaluation. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Clayton. Thank, thank you, you for Mr. the Chair. questions. Oh, so when Bruce, uh, I know you know him quite Avenue very well. I know you got a lot of work to do, and you got to test it. You think this, if all things going well, this could be uh, a solution for Mimico Avenue with the buses traveling on there, possibly if you do your study and things go well? Yeah, and, you know, and if these are adopted as, as for use in the City of Toronto, it will still follow the traffic calming process. So it doesn't necessarily, the street may not meet the warrants still, So, but it would just be another tool in the toolbox. So Mimico, for example, it would possibly be work on that street as well. Well, if you can keep that in the back of your mind, it would be great. So. Okay, I see no further no, questions. No, no, I, 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 oh, I'm I, sorry, Councilor Prusa. Yeah, uh, so so thanks for showing us what a, what a traffic cushion looks like. Uh, the the wheel space, that that groove in there, would that allow emergency vehicles like ambulances and fire trucks and and so on to 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 be able to go through like a bus and not not be rocked? Yeah, so the, the there's one photo of a, a fire truck going through. Obviously, it's it's a similar wheelbase as the TTC, so it would be also in the intention of it going through without experiencing the jolt. Now, in terms of recreational vehicles, from you know from um, cars to uh, to SUVs and pickup trucks and things like that. Um, does are any of those uh, um, do any of those uh, go through that 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 channel as well or or how does that work? 
Yeah, no, it's supposed to. So the, the, the width of it is designed such that an SUV would still feel the bump, essentially, whereas it's just the, the wider vehicles that would, would go in between. That's how the engineering is and the design is. Uh, and that's part of what we'll be reviewing, you know, when we put these things in. There, there obviously are specs to put them in, and we'll be designing it to those specs, and we'll see how it works if they're effective. Okay, so so but but technically, people would still be able to like one tire through the channel, or one 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 tire alignment through the channel, and then one would take it because I you know when you take it that way, you don't you don't really feel that rock. You don't really don't feel that. Uh, you know the 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 effect of the hump itself. You can almost take it at speed and and not feel it very much, right? Yeah, I, I understand your question, and, and it may have to be supplemented with flex posts. We're not sure. This will be all part of the evaluation. But if if we do find that exactly as you described, that they are straddling it and still proceeding at speed, it will have to be looked at and see whether it's successful. That's the word straddling. Okay. And in terms of snow removal, uh, humps uh, usually. Are, are problematic uh, for snow plows and and snow removal. And uh, how, do these cushions fare any better in that regard? Uh, not really. Um, and sometimes snow is left in the groove in the middle. Um, so they, I, I don't know if that's been evaluated that thoroughly, but that's one of the negatives is there's still snow remains when the, the plow goes over sort of in the in the center space. Um, so I, I wouldn't and, say that means better. Yeah. And and with continual action, that would have a tendency to ice, no? It could, yeah. So that's part of the the review. Okay. Um, so and and these have never been used in the city of Toronto before, right? Because I don't like like Councillor Holiday when you use the word cushions. I didn't know what it looked like until you showed the photo of it. Well, they actually have been used on a temporary basis. Um, apparently, as part of Metrolink's construction, they had some bus diversion off Eglinton, and they put them on one of the side streets. Um, and so this was brought to our attention by the TTC. So it's kind of gone from that one example, temporary example, to to this being, a, in a sense, a second location. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Why wouldn't you consider, instead of humps that are really problematic and all the rest of it, you know those... Um, those things that you bolt to the middle of the road and they're rubber and they kind of like can get knocked over. Use those effectively to sort of pinch the road, like make the road narrower in certain gaps so that in, in, and it'll probably be even more cost effective. And, um, well, and, and then you wouldn't be putting a sort of a hump hazard in the middle of the street, but you'd creating, be creating this effect that you're narrowing the street so that uh, forcing people to slow down because they'd have to sort of, you know, hit a much narrower uh, point in the road unless they wanted to hit those things. Why wouldn't you like, like I've seen them in 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 other in other cities. Uh, I've seen them. I think in Montreal they use them very effectively. Uh, I I saw them all over, but we've never considered those. And I see them now show up in relation to delineating bicycle lanes. But why wouldn't you consider that as as a means by which to try to reduce speeds on streets? I think you're referring to the, the flex bollards, and we have used them at certain locations um, as a temporary measure, sort of between before we can install a permanent feature, they're, they're, they're put temporarily. Um, we've used them on Marine Parade Drive, for example. Um, so th it is an option, a temporary option. Um, it is in our toolbox. Why is it temporary? Like, why? Why? Because it's just it's cost effective? Well, usually it takes a number of years to do a permanent installation to pour concrete or no, to no, build out. But, a, yeah. So, so what I'm saying, concrete. instead of instead of pouring concrete and creating a permanent hazard, why wouldn't why wouldn't the temporary solution be be you know quasi permanent in the sense that why do you call it temporary? Why people hit them and break them and then you need to replace them? It's just um, it's a trial, and then usually the the ultimate goal is to do something more permanent. So. We do it as temporary, you know, there's nothing to say we couldn't leave them and never convert them to a to a permanent. However, yeah. generally, it's just an, a quick, easy thing to do in advance of putting something in more permanent. Okay, so so how would you, so, Councilor, uh, Prucha, yeah, Prucha, in, the, in your Prucha, report? Prucha, Councilor Prucha, we're talking about speed cushions. We're kind of getting off topic here, yeah. my friends. So 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 we're talking about so, speed cushions. Yeah, can I, can I, 
add Mr. that Chair, to your report? Mr. Chair, we're off topic here. We're I, off topic. I'm trying to tell my oh, friend, you Council guys, Sister you, Rob Thomas. You guys, I love each and every one of you. Like, yeah, look but, at you. Okay, I'm looking Anthony. at you. I've Council missed you. My I've, friend. I have missed each and every one of you all summer long. I want to okay. give you all a great big hug. Would you be able to include that as part of your report, these temporary things and, and making them sort of, you know, more permanent? Because I think they would be very, very cost effective, and it wouldn't be like a permanent uh, alteration to the roadway, right? Yeah, certainly. I think Councilor Councilor, Holiday would like that. I can, I can get back to you because, as I say, it is in our toolbox now, and we have done it at location. So if there are locations you you would like us to consider, we can we can look into that. So we can have a further discussion on this uh, separate if you would like. All right, we're way over time. Yeah. Councilor Proots will give you six now. We're way over time. Thank you. Any further questions of staff on uh, Councilor Ford's motion? Seeing none, Councilor Ford. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and look, I, I appreciate the conversation um, and the interest my colleagues are are putting into this. Um, I'll, I'll be brief in the interest of time. Uh, North Etobicoke doesn't like to take up too much of community council's time, as we all know. Um, but this particular um, situation came to my attention um, back after a, a shooting that happened in, in our uh, area where four people were shot. Uh, three children. Um, of course, coming out of that, um, Mayor Tory and myself uh, in the following days went out to the community. Um, tensions were high. Uh, no member of council, um, you know, uh, I think we all, sorry, we all understand how um, how I come. The one thing I heard from the community and, and the mayor did unanimously Sir Ford, you're cutting in and yep. out. We're losing you. Oh, shoot. Hello? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Why don't you turn um, off your video, Councilor Ford? We're, you're cutting in and out. Councilor, Councilor Ford, are you there? Hello? Yeah, we hear you now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yep. we hear Hello? you. Okay, sorry, sorry about this, but to, to cut to the chase, uh, we heard from the community that the speeding in the community and people coming from outside the community, coming into the community, was contributing to some of the safety issues that residents were experiencing. Um, look, I, I don't like to shed light on this, but, you know, in, in Tanridge, there, there has been drive-by shootings. Um, and if you look at the particular makeup of the community, um, it is a circle. So when uh, these incidents, although somewhat rare, but when they do happen, um, it is a fast in, fast out along the loop. Um, so following that, uh, we engage with transportation. We do know it was on a bus route. Uh, we shared uh, the concerns of the community with them. Um, and I really have to thank Bruce um, and his team for thinking outside the box here, coming up with a solution. Um, Look, uh, whether these are temporary <clears throat> tournaments, I know staff are going to be keeping an eye on this. Uh, my office engaged with TTC. Uh, they're supportive of this. Um, so, you know, uh, for members of council, uh, my position on this, I'm very open minded. Uh, if it works, um, then I would like uh, in the community would like to see them permanently there. If it doesn't work, then you know what? We, we put our thinking caps back on and we come up with different solutions. Um, but uh, again, I want to thank city staff uh, for really helping us on this. Um, and, and uh, you know, don't take it from me, take it from the community. Uh, they will be very happy uh, to see this and in the city responding um, to some of their uh, requests. And there's many more requests they have had uh, of myself and, and the mayor. Um, and the mayor has been uh, really active in this as well. Um, so thank you, um, and uh, as we have in front of us, we'd like to move this to City Council. Thank you, Councilor Ford. Any further speakers? Chair, on the motions on the screen. No, no, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Deputy Mayor Alde. I I do, and I, I again with the greatest respect for the local councilor on these matters. Um, um, my colleagues will know I'm particularly fussy about traffic calming. 
and uh, in the details behind it. Um, and I, I would love to help uh, Councilor Ford in every way and this community in every way. However, um, I'm not prepared to support it be for the very clear fact that I don't have a staff report in front of me. And uh, I just, I feel, and I don't know, I mean, I'll have to give staff direction on this. I mean, that's up to Councilor Ford. But I feel that there should be some paper behind it because I don't know what we tell the next community that comes along and asks for it. So I don't know where the start and end of this is. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I actually think there's some great innovation in here. And uh, there's, there are things that the city can do to help the community. But I just, I need to have that documentation to have my support on it. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's difficult to vote against an item like this for all of the reasons of why it's going to improve things. But, uh, but I need to see that uh, in order to put my support behind it. So I thought I'd offer that explanation and I would like to be recorded in the negative. Um, and I really look forward to transportation services bringing some more reports on this forward uh, because there are places that this can be a great solution, but I need to see their underwriting of these particular initiatives uh, to ensure that we have some methodology when uh, people see this and want to put it in other parts of the city and we have a way to govern where it should go and where it shouldn't. Um, so those are my reasons um, with the greatest respect to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor uh, Any further speakers? Uh, Councilor Prutza? I'll keep it really brief. You know, I'm I'm a little like Councilor Holiday. I have serious trepidations about road alterations that are um, significant, permanent, and, and forever. And in my view, uh, to deal with kind of one-offs, you you basically um, you know create a hazard in the middle of a of a public highway. Um, and uh, so I, I I have some reservations, but I'm going to support Councillor Ford on this, and I'll tell you why I'm going to support him. I I know that he's been dealing with um, the situations very similar to to mine, and uh, what I know of Tandridge Crescent is this. It's not a through area. It's not a neighborhood that someone will drive into to get through to get somewhere else. And so use it as a sort of a public highway to get from somewhere to somewhere. Uh, you're going to Tanridge if you live there, if you got business there, or if you're visiting somebody there, or if you're looking for somebody there. Right. And it's it's essentially a an oval kind of street that doesn't it doesn't go anywhere from it to, to anywhere, and if that neighborhood and Councillor Ford, I suspect, has the pulse of it, if that neighborhood is saying to itself, "Look, we think that with some kind of hazard in the middle of the street, and these um, bad guys who are coming into this neighborhood to shoot it up, or to create or, or to do harm, uh, we'll have to go at a slower pace." And, uh, you know, they'll be more visible. Uh, they won't be able to get away as quickly. Uh, they, they, you know, they won't be able to, to, to do uh, what they're looking to do because they have to be more, more cautious and more measured. Then I'm happy to sort of bear the expense and put the hazard in the middle of the street. Um, you know, despite a, uh, a council report uh, that you know a broader report in that regard. So, so we 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 create this hazard, but really what it's impacting is we're it's impacting that particular neighborhood. Just the people that kind of live there um, are going to 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 connect with somebody there for some whatever reason, or or visiting somebody there. Or uh, um, so it's not it's not a broader impact. So uh, I'm I'm going to trust that um, that this is a measure that will go some ways. To helping him deal with uh, a very aggressive, uh, hostile situation, and if it uh, soothes the um, the concerns of some of the residents there uh, in saying that they're doing something uh, better for their neighborhood, then I'm happy. I'm happy to support it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Prutza. Any further speakers? Seeing none, I'll just very quick speak very quickly. So I applaud Councilor Ford for bringing this forward. You know, it's our job to bring some ideas uh, forward that we may see other places. I think the TTC, uh, Mr. Clayton, I mentioned they've used it. And I've had a great relationship with uh, Bruce Clayton, bringing the mid-road signs on Park Lawn, um, you know, the, the pedestrian crossovers down in uh, Humber Bay Shores. So it's our job to bring some of these ideas forward and let staff go out there and uh, 
and, and do these pilot projects, see if they work. And there's some great ideas that have been brought forward by councillors, believe it or not. But uh, I'll be supporting Councillor Ford on this thing. It's uh, out of the box thinking, and uh, I think it's a great idea. So I'll be supporting it. Uh, just before uh, we vote on it, I'm going to have to ask for a recorded vote because Councillor Holiday asked to have you record in the negative. The only way we can do that is a recorded vote. So I'm asking for a recorded vote. Nancy? So we have a motion from Councillor Ford amending the item. Uh, when I call your name, please indicate how you're voting. Councillor Grimes. In the affirmative. Councillor Ford. In favor. Councillor Holliday. Opposed. Councillor Nunziata. In favor. Councillor Peruzza. In favor. That item carries. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, just going back to 26, 28, the economic development culture issues. So we are, Councillor Prutza forgot to move receipt of that item, didn't you, Councillor Prutza? So you're moving receipt? Yeah, Councillor Prutza is moving receipt of uh, item 26, 28. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thanks, Councillor Prutza. Okay, moving right along. I think 2631 is a non residential demolition application. Uh, 975 Western Road, Councillor Nunziata. Questions of staff? No, I just. Nope. Um, I, Anybody I have just questions like of staff? To... Seeing none, Councillor Nunziata. Yeah, so I, 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 you do have the motion. So if you can just put the motion on the screen to approve the application to demolish the vacant non residential one story building with following conditions. Okay. Of course, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, 2632, Council approach at the motion uh, you added at the end. Uh, question staff? No questions. And there's really no title. Could you just for the benefit of the public, what is this uh, 2632? What is it? So, so, so basically, Mr. Chair, it's a reopening of a fence exemption uh, that we dealt with uh, some months ago. And the street, uh, sorry? Lomar uh, Drive, Lomar, uh, 102 Lomar Drive. Thank you, Councilor Prince. So, just a reopening. Uh, it, it, it's it's a reopening, and then I just like to give a thirty second okay. explanation as to why I'm doing it. So, I need a motion to reopen. Sure. All in favor? I'll move it. Yeah. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Councilor Prince. Yeah. So, so Mr. Chair, this really is just a, a request to bring the report the report back. Uh, uh, at the next meeting uh, of community council, uh, following the uh, community council decision, uh, I uh, I uh, was called and met with the local residents, uh, and they indicated that they uh, very much wanted to make representation to the matter um, uh, at community council. Uh, they, they they weren't able to do that. Um, I. Uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, sometimes it's it's technology, sometimes it's notices, sometimes it's you know things get get jumbled up. But for whatever reason, I, I believe that the uh, that the residents uh, should be able to to make representation to this matter, uh, and it's it's in that effort and uh, in the spirit of that uh, that I ask that the matter be reopened and that uh, and that we uh, consider this at the. Uh, at the next, uh, uh, re reconsider it, or 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 have an, give the residents an opportunity to make a deputation to this matter at the next meeting of um, community council, and that the clerk advise um, uh, the both residents uh, that uh, that they have the opportunity uh, to speak to the to, to the matter. Okay, thank you, Council Prince. So we we voted to reopen. I guess we have to just vote to, uh, again on it. I guess so. All in favor of the motion, Council Prince. Opposed, that Thank is you. carried. I believe that is it, Nancy. Is that correct? Yes, we just need to enact the bylaws. So we'll put those motions on the screen okay. for you. And Mr. Chair, while while we are waiting, it's so good to see you all again. Uh, uh, I hope the uh, uh, the short little break that we had for those of you who had a break um, uh, was enjoyable this summer. It was uh, it was a beautiful summer. Sure was. Yeah. Okay. So motion on the Toga York Community Council pass and declare bylaws six nine nine to seven hundred five prepared for the 6th, September tenth, twenty twenty, being twenty six of the Community Council. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 
and number motion two that the Otoe York Community Council pass and declare as a bylaw the confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Togo York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting 26 on September 10th, 2021. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, everybody. Motion adjourned by Councillor Peruzza. All in favor? So opposed? Carried. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all again soon.